<coughs> so hello to all of you so myself dr shilpi agarwal and uh, we will be today discussing the 25 most important clinical questions of anatomy and i could see like many of the students have already joined and yes this is my favorite shairi he is totally correct i could see the shairi over here that is actually my favorite <laughs> so before we start the session i want to speak few words if you read this what is written over here don't focus on the pain focus on the progress means is samay jo aap taiyari kar rahe ho jo bhi preparation kar rahe ho i understand we all understand ki it is a tough time it is in fact very tough time morning se leke evening tak padhai and there are so much hectic schedules you have to study the whole day so this is not very easy task okay this is not very easy we all know it is a tough task और बहुत ना परेशानी होती है लगता है कि अरे हम पूरे दिन पढ़ रहे हैं कुछ और नहीं कर रहे हैं कहीं घूम नहीं सकते सिर्फ पढ़ाई करनी है दिमाग में एक स्ट्रेस है एंगजाइटी है बट लेट मी टेल यू उस चीज़ पे मत फोकस करो कि कितनी टेंशन है कितनी एंगजाइटी है दिन कितने कम बचे हैं उस चीज़ पर फोकस ना करके आप इस चीज़ पर फोकस करो कि आपको आगे बढ़ते जाना प्रोग्रेस करना डे बाई डे आपका प्रोग्रेस होना चाहिए आज जो आप कर रहे हो उसमें नेक्स्ट डे एड अप होना चाहिए जो भी आप मटेरियल पढ़ रहे हो जो भी आप सब्जेक्ट पढ़ रहे हो तो आपको खुद को ये फील होना चाहिए कि यस डे बाय डे आई एम प्रोग्रेसिंग सो दैट इज़ वेरी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट सो डोंट स्टॉप इन बिटवीन एनी वेयर कहीं पर भी बीच में नहीं रुकना है ये नहीं सोचना कि मैं <coughs> कर पाऊँगा एग्ज़ाम में ठीक से या नहीं कर पाऊँगा इन सब थाट्स को बिल्कुल भी नहीं सोचना है यू जस्ट कीप प्रोग्रेसिंग डे बाई डे रोज़ मेहनत करते रहो and definitely you will be successful so let us start with the questions over here so today as you can see this is a clinical question now in anatomy you are getting three types of questions one liners one liners you can very well deal properly like you can very well deal with them we have been studying it uh, a lot of times you have studied in the in the various notes and at various places so one liners are easy to easy to deal with and if the one liner question comes na it is just like a halwa kare wa halwa mil gaya plate mein rakh ke to one liner question to it's very easy then another type of question is image based question so images are very very important in anatomy and you have to go through all the images now third type of question is clinical integrated question and yes you should be well prepared for such kind of questions because any time they can give you and it can be like 3 uh, 4 clinical questions or they can be 6 7 clinical integrated questions that totally is like it depends so you should be well prepared for that like when you see this first question okay let us see this first question what is there it is a clinical integrated question you have studied every point over here but when you start reading the question you feel first of all you feel oh my god so many lines are there theek hai sabse pehle dimag mein aata hai itni sari lines hai is question mein isko padhe padhte padhne se pehle aapke dimag mein aata hai ki kya main kar paunga yes you can do it you can easily solve this question and let us read this question over here try to answer the question so the question is a man came to the emergency after accident he suffered from injury where to right sided upper limb so that means this is a question of upper limb as well as if you see the options you know that this is a nerve injury question which is of the upper limb next thing on examination the clinician found that there is sensory loss let us see what is which type of sensory loss is this sensory loss one minute please there is sensory loss towards the lateral aspect of the forearm okay the sensory loss is where towards the lateral aspect lateral aspect of what forearm it is towards the forearm not towards the arm it is towards the forearm now another thing is that abduction at the shoulder is found to be normal the abduction is normal and when you say further when you read further it is written as movements at elbow were affected so that means the movements at the elbow were affected as well as there is a sensory loss so these are the two main symptoms in this question according to which you have to answer now when when you uh, when you see such kind of question a very like um, whenever you are seeing any nerve injury question especially in the upper limb a very important thing is that sensory loss location if you uh, if you see in the question the sensory loss location is mentioned by that you can directly answer the question 
you can directly answer that which type of nerve injury is this. For example, if I just focus on this line, this is a keyword over here. These are the keywords over here for this whole question. The sensory loss is where towards the lateral aspect of fora. And when I'm talking about the sensory supply of the whole of the upper limb, and let us focus on the lateral aspect of the forearm. So the lateral aspect of the forearm, it is supplied by lateral cutaneous nerve of forearm, which is a branch of what? It is a branch of musculocutaneous nerve. It is a branch of the musculocutaneous nerve. So now we have understood that this area is supplied by a branch from the musculocutaneous nerve. Now if I see the other areas, let us see the other areas also. <coughs> Another important area over here is upper lateral cutaneous nerve of arm which is a branch of axillary nerve. So whenever the axillary nerve injury is there, okay, see what I am saying axillary nerve injury is there. In that case there will be sensory loss where on the lateral aspect of the arm, upper and lateral aspect of the arm. Why? Because this sensory branch is coming from where it is coming from the axillary nerve. So what do you see? According to the sensory loss, you can answer the nerve injury quickly. If it is the sensory loss in the upper and the lateral aspect of arm, the answer will become axillary nerve. And now if we see in this question, it is mentioned lateral aspect of forearm. So the answer will be musculocutaneous nerve. Now one more thing over here is that we can also see that in the other areas, lateral lower cutaneous nerve of arm, it is supplied by radial nerve as well as we say that towards the posterior side the posterior cutaneous nerve of arm and the forearm this is also supplied by the radial nerve and when you talk about the medial cutaneous nerve of arm and the forearm these two the medial cutaneous nerve of arm and forearm these two are the branches of brachial plexus brachial plexus specifically we say medial cord branches okay these are the branches of the medial cord the medial cord of the brachial plexus so now overall when we say what is more important for us the more important for us is this one and this one because they are more commonly asked so now we know this is axillary nerve and this one over here this one over here is for the musculocutaneous nerve right so if i come back to the question in the question we have focused on this point so let us come back to the question over here, sensory loss towards lateral aspect of forearm. Then apart from that, it is written as abduction at shoulder is normal. So that means axillary nerve is not affected. The axillary nerve, first of all the sensory loss area is different, plus the axillary nerve involvement leads to uh, loss of abduction at the shoulder. So now when you have to decide between the other options, you have to decide between A, B and D. And now you know sensory loss according to the sensory loss as I said it is a key word you can quickly come to the answer according to the sensory loss and we say it is musculocutaneous nerve and due to the musculocutaneous nerve there is also one more symptom there is loss of flexion at elbow because why because it supplies three muscles BBC, biceps brachii, brachialis and the coracobrachialis which are the muscles of the entire compartment of the arm area. So because this three muscles are paralyzed, it leads to the loss of flexion at the elbow. And thereby you can see the symptom is written over here, movements at the elbow were affected. When we talk about the median and the ulnar nerve, in this uh, the deformities are totally different. The deformities are usually associated towards the hand area. In the median nerve, you say that there is a benediction hand, ape thumb deformity, and pointing index, mainly towards the hand area. Spe uh, also for the ulnar nerve, whenever we are talking about the deformity, we say it is a partial claw hand. So the deformities over there are, are different. The movements affected are different. So when we talk about this question, the answer of this question is what? The answer of this question is musculocutaneous nerve. It is a musculocutaneous nerve and we have understood this nerve supply also over here. So the answer of this question is musculocutaneous nerve. Just, um, just give me a minute over here.
<clears throat> okay. So that is great. We ha I can see that a lot of you have answered D and that is very correct. Now let us go for that question number two. Let us read the question number two. What is written over here? A person is not able to hold paper between what? It is, he is not able to hold paper. If I say that this is a paper, he is not able to hold the paper between which finger? Fourth and fifth. Okay, this is fourth and fifth between this. So he is not able to hold the paper between fourth and fifth finger. When you talk about this, what do you understand? We are doing paper test. Okay, paper test or we say we are doing the card test. Very correct. So, paper test or the card test. Now, he cannot, one more symptom is there that he cannot flex the metacarpophalangeal joint. He cannot flex the metacarpophalangeal joint of the same fingers. So, let us try to do this. Fourth and fifth finger at the metacarpophalangeal joint. This is the metacarpophalangeal joint over here. The person is not able to flex over here. Flexion means this is the flexion at the metacarpophalangeal joint. And if you are not able to flex over here means this. What is this? This is a claw hand. But over here, they are saying specifically of fourth and fifth finger. Specifically of the fourth and fifth finger means this deformity. Yes, very right. Yes, alnar gai is ki. So, this is very, very right. So, over here, the person is having actually the partial claw hand. So, he is not able to flex at the metacarpophalangeal joint of fourth and the fifth finger. Let us see one more thing. There is a sensory loss also. Now, when we talk about the sensory loss, the sensory loss is towards little finger. So, now again, according to the sensory loss, you can quickly answer. Like, if you are not able to understand the other points, then the keyword over here is always what? It is a sensory loss. You can quickly answer with the help of the sensory loss. The sensory loss towards little finger. So, this area is supplied only by ulnar nerve. So, all these structures, all these points are regarding the ulnar nerve. The sensory loss also according to the ulnar nerve. Now, it says that the structure responsible <coughs> for the following symptoms is likely to be damaged at what location? So, when you see the locations over here, yes, very correct, very, very correct. The answer over here is medial epicondyle. When you say surgical neck, it actually leads to axillary nerve injury. When you say shaft, it leads to the median nerve injury and when you say supracondylar region, mainly it is the median nerve or anti-entrocious nerve injury and now when you talk about the medial epicondyle, it is the ulnar nerve injury. So, the fractures at these locations, different different locations of the humerus leads to the injury of the different different nerves and we know that these are the main structures of the humerus which are related directly or closely to the nerves, to these nerves and therefore, when the fracture is at the medial epicondyle, the nerve injured is ulnar nerve. Okay, ulnar nerve. And it is leading to what? Partial or the ulnar claw hand. And what happens over here? This two fingers over here, this one, the fourth and the fifth finger, this one, they are going into the clawing. And when we say they are going into the clawing at metacarpophalangeal joint, they will be hyperextension. <coughs> there will be hyperextension. So, we say basically that the person is not able to flex and there is hyperextension at the level of metacarpophalangeal joint. And when you see the PIP and DIP, so what is happening over here? PIP, this is the PIP and this is the DIP joint. So, what is happening over here? Yes, this is a flexion which is occurring. So, mainly we take which joint? Mainly we take MCP. That what is happening over here? If the hyperextension is present at this location, we say it is the claw hand. Now, this is the partial claw hand when you talk about the complete claw hand. The complete claw hand is the injury of both median nerve and the ulnar nerve. Now, let us see, yes, so for this, the answer over here is the second, uh, for the question number second, the answer is medial epicondyle. Now, let us come to the third question. <clears throat> okay, let us come to this third question over here. Let us read the question, the patient had loss of extension at fingers. See, the movement over here is different. Earlier we were talking about the flexion-flexion movement, but now the word is coming over here, extension. So, uh, take care of this word, loss of extension at fingers. When you think of log loss of extension at fingers, this is extension and when the extension is not able to occur at wrist or at the fingers, what happens? Yes, I'm just giving you a hint. So, a patient has loss of extension 
there is loss of extension at fingers. Now, what is the further point over here? This is a tricky question. And uh, if you are able to do this question, you can do any question on the radial nerve. Any question. And such kind of questions do come. Like I could see that one of the person is asking that if this kind of question, you can just go and see the recall questions of last year's and uh, earlier questions. Such kind of questions, they come. They, they have come actually. So, on examination, it has been found, it was found that the extension at the elbow, what? Extension at the elbow is normal. And the weak extension was present at the wrist. The weak extension is present at the wrist. Very great, great, great. I can find that a lot, lot of students are trying to answer, a lot of you have, are trying to answer this. This is very, very great. So, what do you see? Extension at the elbow is normal. So, the person is able to extend at the elbow but at the wrist weak extension weak extension is present no sensory loss no sensory loss is present now what kind of nerve injury is this so what do you see everything is okay okay everything is okay elbow is okay wrist is also weak extension is possible no sensory loss is there only one main symptom is there what is that one main symptom this is one main symptom loss of extension at the fingers, which we actually say as what? It is given the term as finger drop. It is given the term as the finger drop. Now, what is it? This is actually related to the radial nerve injury. And now, if you see the options, you will say, ma'am, A, B, C, all are radial nerve. Option A, B, C, all are radial nerve. So, this is a trick that you have to choose between A, B and C. All these options are radial nerve options. So, now, how will you choose? Yes, yes, very correct. So, before I tell you the answer, I can see a lot of you have already answered, but let us first of all discuss. Now, when you talk about the radial nerve, how the radial nerve is running? We very well know it is running through the spiral groove. So, it comes from the axilla, this is the axilla area, and then after the axilla, it runs into the spiral groove, and after the spiral groove, it reaches where? It reaches the lateral epicondyle of the humerus. And now, when it reaches the lateral epicondyle of humerus, it gives two branches, one is the superficial branch, which is a sensory branch. You can see the word written over here. And another branch is the deep branch. What is that? Yes, posterior interosseous nerve. And what is written in the bracket over here? It is a motor branch. What do you understand by sensory? Sensory means supplies skin only. And motor means supplies muscles only. So, if this branch will it will be sensory loss. And when this branch will it will be muscle paralysis. होगा. So, when this branch is gone, only sensory loss. If this branch is gone, motor loss. So, now <clears throat> we have understood this uh, pathway of the, of the nerve over here. And now if I say the lesion is at the level of axilla. So, all the branches are gone. There will be loss of extension at the elbow, wrist drop, finger drop and the sensory loss. When the lesion is at the level of B, that is at the spiral groove. So, now what will happen as the lesion level comes down, one one symptom decreases. So, over here we say wrist drop, finger drop, sensory loss is there. The extension at the elbow is, weak extension is possible. It is possible. Now, lesion C at the level of elbow. So, it can be of two types. One is the lateral epicondyle fracture. Another is injury of posterior interosseous nerve only. Now, when the lateral epicondyle fracture is there, so what will happen? Finger drop and the sensory loss. Both the things are seen. The extension at the elbow is okay and at the wrist, some extension is possible. Weak extension. So, complete wrist drop is not there. Weak extension is possible over here. And now, when we specifically talk about only the posterior interosseous nerve injury. So, over here we see only one symptom. What is that one symptom? Only finger drop. No sensory loss, no other symptoms, only finger drop. Finger drop means that there will be loss of extension at the fingers. And for that, you can understand by this image, the fracture at the lateral epicondyle, it will be over here. So, it is going to affect both the branches. But when I say only the posterior interosseous nerve, so I say only this nerve is affected. And in that case, the sensory branch is intact. So, that is why we say no sensory loss. Okay, when posterior interosseous nerve injury will be done, then the rest branches are okay. So, that's why only this symptom will come. No sensory loss, no other symptom will come. Only finger drop. So, when you see in any question that only the finger drop is mentioned and nothing else, then we say what? So, let us come back to the question. 
Now you can answer the question. Now we have to be, we have to answer more specific answer. Which is the best answer over here? Yes. Now we say that the answer of this question is posterior interosseous nerve. It cannot be radial nerve because radial nerve, if it is injured, a lot of symptoms will be there. If the superficial branch of radial nerve is gone, sensory loss will be there. Only sensory loss. And if this PIN nerve is gone, then only the finger drop is seen. So the answer of this question is very, very correct. I can see that the answer over here is the posterior interosseous nerve. Now for the wrist drop, this is how the wrist drop is seen. And for the finger drop, the fingers are unable to extend. Very, very correct. Very, very correct. The answer over here is C, posterior interosseous nerve. So now you are able to understand that how you have to approach for radial nerve quotient. If you are able to do this quotient, you can do all the quotients related to radial nerve. Now over here we have discussed radial nerve, we have discussed uh, the ulnar nerve and over here only I will also mention the median nerve lesion in which you are having three deformities. This is what? Benediction deformity. This is the ape thumb and this is the pointing index. Now, usually I've seen a lot of students say, ma'am, how to differentiate benediction deformity from ulnar claw hand? A lot of students, they have this doubt. This is what? Benediction deformity. And now this I show you. This is what? This is ulnar claw hand. Now you can see the difference over here. What is the difference? The difference you will see according to the metacarpophalangeal joint of this fingers. Now when you see in the benediction, what do you see at the metacarpophalangeal joint for the fourth and fifth finger? You see that it is flexing over here. There is a flexion over here. Okay, there is a flexion like this at the level of fourth and fifth finger. But when you see the metacarpophalangeal joint in the partial claw hand, what do you see? The hand is like this. There is a hyperextension at this MCP joint in the partial claw hand. So by this you can differentiate between benediction deformity and the partial claw hand. And you should be able to differentiate. Now these, these are the three nerve injuries which are very commonly asked. One time they ask radial nerve, another time they ask ulnar nerve. So this is one of the expected questions for you. Any of the three nerve injuries can be asked. Twice they have asked ulnar nerve, twice they have asked radial nerve. Either they can repeat it or they can ask new question on median nerve. So be prepared for these three nerves which are very, very important. Okay. So tell yourself you can and you will. Again and again you have to tell yourself that yes, I can and I will. बहुत सारे doubts आते हैं दिमाग में जब आप ये question करते हो आपको लगता है कि यार मैंने पढ़ा था पूरा लेकिन ये question मैं क्यों नहीं कर पा रहा हूँ कई बार बहुत ज़्यादा doubt आता है now you are doing this question and whenever this question will come in front of you next time it will never go wrong so don't worry about any things you have a lot of time to improve yourself as I told you progress progress improve improve each day and tell yourself that you can and you will इतने सारे लोगों ने क्लियर किया एग्जाम तो आप क्यों नहीं कर सकते पॉजिटिव की तरफ सोचो नेगेटिव मत देखो पॉजिटिव सोचोगे पॉजिटिव होगा लाइफ में बिल्कुल होगा जितना आप पॉजिटिव सोचोगे पॉजिटिविटी आपके पास आएगी सो बी पॉजिटिव एंड टेल योर माइंड डेली आई कैन एंड आई विल आई विल प्रूव सो लेट एस कम टू द नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन ओके लेट एस रीड दिस क्वेश्चन ना दीज क्वेश्चन आर नॉट टफ You will, uh, like whenever you are reading this question, you will realize that this question is not tough. I have made it a little bit tricky, but as you read the question, it, looks like it, it becomes very easy. It's not so difficult. So let us see uh, this question over here. <clears throat> a 55-year-old female consults her physician complaining of, complaining of what? Keyword. What is the keyword over here? Tingling. The tingling is the keyword. Whenever you see any question, either it is a seven line question or it is a four line question or it is a ten line question, if it is written tingling sensation, what should come in your mind? Compression of a nerve. That there is a compression of a nerve. Okay, so this should come in your mind that there is a compression of the nerve and let us see where over the palmar aspect of her thumb, index finger, middle finger, lateral side of ring finger, of her right hand. Now, when you see what is this palmar aspect, this is a palmar aspect, thumb, index finger, middle finger, lateral side of ring finger. So, when you see this area, so there is a tingling sensation in this area and when you say tingling sensation in this area, you say, oh, yes, now I know. 
एकदम याद आते हैं अरे ये तो कुछ है ही नहीं मीडिया नर्व दिस इज द स्किन विच इज सप्लाइड बाई मीडिया नर्व दिस इज द एरिया विच इज सप्लाइड बाई मीडिया नर्व एंड वेन आई से टिंगलिंग सेंसेशन ओवर हेयर देन यू आंसर इट क्विकली that this is the compression of the median nerve so by reading these first two three lines you have come you have reached to the answer and let let us see the other lines over here the other lines are just to make a story pura jo aap seven or eight lines of question dekhte ho usme aadha to story hoti hai aur do teen lines hi hoti hai which are the keywords so let us see further what is written over here the other points are just like story they the symptoms begin gradually over the past two years lately has become more intense they are more marked during the night keeping her awake this is accompanied by wasting in the thinner eminence why wasting in the thinner eminence again this, this is due to the median nerve involvement because the median nerve is the one the median nerve is the one which is actually supplying the majority of thinner muscles and over here the sensory loss also we have understood this is the involvement of the median nerve and when you see the options over here only this option is telling you that there is a median nerve compression and i can see that everybody has answered very well that this is what the answer over here is compression of median nerve the answer over here is carpal tunnel syndrome now what do you understand by this question now question does not mean ki if this question comes you should be able to answer carpal tunnel this question means that if such kind of question comes even for other syndromes you should be able to answer your concept should be clear whenever they are saying tingling sensation you should think about that the nerve supplying the skin is compressed and then you should look for the nerves that which nerve is supplying that area and if you have this concept you can answer any of the question like last year uh, last uh, exam in the july exam they have asked about the meralgia paresthetica in that they have said ki that there is a uh, pain and the and the and the tingling sensation towards the lateral side of the thigh so you have to look for the option that which nerve can supply the lateral aspect of thigh so the concept should be clear now for example if i say this is the area for median nerve now what about the other areas what about the other nerves ulnar nerve radial nerve what about other nerves yes so you should be knowing that what is the sensory supply of the hand over here if i am saying palm area the median nerve is supplying the lateral three and a half fingers and the adjacent palm and the rest of the area is supplied by what yes the rest of the area is supplied by ulnar nerve so ulnar nerve is supplying what area the little finger and the what as you see in the image medial half of ring finger Similarly, when you come towards the posterior side, dorsum. This is termed as dorsum also. So you should be clear of this word also, dorsum. If they write only dorsum, in this we say ulnar nerve distribution is the same, but the median nerve distribution is only towards what nail beds, and the rest of the area is supplied by the rest of the area is supplied by radial nerve. So now in this, if I change. the question and i say that this uh, tingling sensation is where the tingling sensation is towards the little finger so the answer will change the answer will become ulnar nerve compression and when i am talking about the ulnar nerve compression there are two syndromes which are associated with that in the ulnar nerve compression there is one syndrome over here which is mentioned is yes the cubital tunnel as well as the guen canal syndrome so these two syndromes are associated with ulnar nerve compression <clears throat> so even if this question comes you will be able to answer now when we are talking about cubital tunnel okay cubital tunnel syndrome means uh, the compression of the nerve is near the elbow area behind the medial epicondyle ठीक है नॉट इन क्यूबाइटल फोसा द कंप्रेशन ऑफ द अलर नर्व इज एट द लेवल ऑफ एल्बो बिहाइंड द मीडियल एपिकोडाइल समटाइम्स सम एक्स्ट्रा लिगमेंट इज प्रेजेंट विच कंप्रेस द नर्व ओवर देयर ग्यून केनाल सिंड्रोम द कंप्रेशन इन द नर्व इज एट द लेवल ऑफ नियर द रेस्ट दैट इज ऑल्सो डिफरेंट स्ट्रक्चर बट यू शुड बी हैविंग इन योर माइंड दैट क्यूबाइटल टेनल सिंड्रोम इज नियर एल्बो एंड ग्यून केनाल सिंड्रोम इज नियर द रेस्ट ना वेन यू से फोर्थ फोर्थ इज वॉट येस fourth is what this is the lower limb this is what it is the compression of this is what the tarsal tunnel syndrome it is a compression of what the tarsal tunnel syndrome very very easy to remember it is a compression towards the lower limb compression of which nerve t t t which t it is the tibial nerve 
So it is a compression of the tibial nerve. And now when you say compression of tibial nerve, again there will be a tingling sensation where at the sole, the skin of sole. So whenever there is tarsal tunnel syndrome, the compression is of TTT, tibial nerve. And where is the tingling, tingling sensation? The tingling sensation will be towards the sole of the foot because the tibial nerve is supplying the skin of the sole. So now even if any of other question is asked, you will be able to answer the other syndromes also. So this is for the compression of the nerves over here. In the lower limb, we are having only mainly the, uh, the tarsal tunnel syndrome, which is the tibial nerve compression. And now we know that the answer of this question is carpal tunnel syndrome. Now let us come to the next question. Now this is like one of the upcoming question for you, which is likely like it can come as a new question. Because when we talk about the pulsation quotient, they have been asking the pulsation quotient. They have been asking it like continuously, then in between they give the break and then again they ask. So you should be prepared for this quotient. This can come as a new quotient in your exam. Now what is it? It is actually the person landed up in the emergency after the road accident and uh, the medical officer asked the intern to quickly take what? Yes, the keyword over here, they are taking the pulse. Pulse means artery pulsation. It is artery pulsation and now it is written over here. Which artery? Radial artery. They have mentioned radial artery pulsation has been taken. What you have to tell is that where has he palpated? So basically you have to tell the location. Where will you palpate the radial artery? And you know the location. This is a very common location. <coughs> yes, yes, very correct, very correct. I can see a lot of you are answering Pooja. Minal, Ashwin, Prashant, Prasad, Alex, very great. So over here, whenever you are taking the radial artery pulsation, see this is a very common pulsation. Jaisi koi OPD mein aata hai, toh sabse pahle aapko kuch aata hai ya nahi aata, pulse jarur check karne aati hai. Sabko pulse check karne aati hai, bade achche se. Toh sabse pahle aap haath pakal leo toh ki lao ji pulse dikhao. So pulse is what? You keep your hand over here. And when you are pulsating, which is the location? Lateral side. So that means either this one or this one. So you have already excluded what? You have already excluded this and this because the hand is towards the lateral side. Now the next thing is lateral to which tendon? This or this? Now when you see flexor carpal radialis, you say this is a tendon which is present on the lateral side and the flexor carpal radialis is present where? Medial side. So now the answer of this question will be lateral to the tendon of flexor carpal radialis because this is the muscle which is actually present on the lateral side. Lateral hai, tabhi usme likha radial, radialis, lateral. And when we are talking about uh, the, I will first of all show you this image. So when you see this forearm area over here, what you see is there are three tendons over here. One, two and this is three. The third one over here, one, two, three. This is a flexor carpi radialis, palmaris longus and the flexor carpi ulnaris, right? So uh, these are the tendons which are present over here. And now when you see the radial artery, you can see radial artery is present where the radial artery is present at this location. So now what do you see? Radial artery is present where? The radial artery is present lateral to flexor carpi radialis. So that is why whenever you are pulsating at this point, we pulsate, we are at the lateral aspect of the flexor carpi radialis. A very common pulse which is taken and you should be knowing the location. Now what are the other locations which you should be knowing in the overall body? First you have said already radial artery pulsation. Okay. Next is brachial artery. The brachial artery we are brachial artery over here, the brachial artery pulsation is taken over here at the cubital fossa. So now when you flex, just flex yourself. Yeah, flex karo. Kaun sa tendon feel ho hai? Which tendon do you feel? This is a tendon of biceps. This is a tendon of biceps. This is a tendon which you feel in the cubital fossa. And if you remember in the cubital fossa, we have, when we talk about the contents, we say the mnemonic is MBBS from medial to lateral side. MBBS. Medial nerve, brachial artery, biceps tendon and then superficial branch of radial nerve from medial to the lateral side. So brachial artery is present where? The brachial artery is medial to biceps brachii tendon. So brachial artery felt at cubital fossa, medial to biceps brachii tendon. Then in the head and neck, a very important pulsation over here when you are doing this pulsation over here, common carotid artery pulsation. What is the main point? 
कैरोटेड और कैसेनाइक टूबर्कल विच इज विच वर्टिब्रा इट इज एक्चुअली रिलेट वी से इट इज प्रेजेंट वेयर इट इज अ टूबर्कल प्रेजेंट इन द सी सिक्स वर्टिब्रा a very very important pulsation so common carotid artery pulsation when you are doing you press against this carotid tubercle then in the lower limb these two pulsations very important in this already the question has been asked on posterior tibial artery pulsation between medial epi uh, medial malleolus and tendocalcaneus and when you talk about the dorsal list pedis pulse it is towards the dorsum of the foot where lateral to extensor hallucis longus tendon over also it is lateral to extensor hallucis longus tendon if you see over here this is the radial artery pulsation this is what brachial artery pulsation the brachial artery pulsation is being done over here and if i see this cubital fossa so in the cubital fossa from the medial to the lateral side we are having m then this is the brachial artery b b so from the medial to the lateral side we are having mbbs and when we see the relations over here this artery is lying medial to the biceps tendon right so this is what we have just mentioned for the brachial artery pulsation for the posterior tibial artery pulsation this is the image between the medial malleolus over here you are having the medial malleolus and over here you are having the tendocalcaneus and when you say dorsal is pedis pulse so what is there a tendon is present over here <clears throat> Which tendon is this? This is the extensor hallucis longus, which is going to the great toe, and just lateral to it, one artery is there, which is dorsalis pedis artery. So when you feel that tendon going to the great toe, and as you go slightly lateral to it, you feel a pulsation, which is a dorsalis pedis artery pulsation. So these are the most important pulsations over here for the question of the pulsations. Any of the arteries can be asked. Lower limb has already been asked, or they can ask you the upper limb or the head, head and neck also. So this is the answer over here. So today, मुश्किल है कल थोड़ा बेहतर होगा. आज मुश्किल है कल थोड़ा बेहतर होगा. बस उम्मीद मत छोड़ना. बस उम्मीद मत छोड़ना. भविष्य जरूर बेहतरीन होगा. So I like I I I'm very sure that you you agree with this. Everybody of you agrees with this. आज थोड़ा सा मुश्किल है बट जितनी मेहनत आपने आज की है अभी तक की है तो बीच में आप उस मेहनत को छोड़ना मत उम्मीद मत छोड़ना बस चलते रहना चलते रहना थोड़ा सा और और भविष्य जरूर बेहतरीन होगा सो लेट एस कम टू द नेक्स्ट क्वेश्चन ओवे है क्वेश्चन नंबर सिक्स ना दिस इज अनदर क्लिनिकल क्वेश्चन द क्लिनिकल इंटीग्रेटेड क्वेश्चन विच इज लाइक वन ऑफ द expected question for you which can come as a new question let us read the question over here a patient presents to you clinic a patient presents to your clinic with a complaints of complaints of redness sweating increased temperature on lateral aspect of face now this is a very typical symptom okay this is a very typical symptom Yes, yes. Uh, I can see Nandi. You are saying in English already. Like uh, this, is so sorry for some portion in Hindi, but I am trying to repeat everything in English. So don't worry about that. So over here, when you see this question, this typical complaint only in one syndrome, only in one uh, in one clinical condition. On the lateral aspect of cheeks, when there is redness, sweating, increased temperature, and let us see what is further written. It is observed. while he is eating some food and the patient has history of what yes now this will confirm everything when they say parotid gland surgery that means this is what this is the frey syndrome they are talking about this is the frey syndrome now yes very very correct very correct and the frey syndrome is what it is the injury of auriculo temporal nerve so very very correct the answer over here is auriculo temporal nerve now whenever you are talking about any question and it is mentioned parotid gland surgery two type of nerve injuries you can expect parotid gland related with facial nerve either the facial nerve will be injured it will lead to what bell's palsy symptoms totally different and the parotid gland if this is a parotid gland towards the upper border of parotid gland there is a, another nerve auriculo temporal nerve sometimes this nerve is injured and if this is injured it leads to different clinical condition known as frey's syndrome 
ठीक है दो है यहाँ पे फेशियल नर्व गई तो बेल्स पैल्सी के सिम्टम मिलेंगे और अगर ऑरिकुलर टेम्पोरल नर्व गई तो फ्रे सिंड्रोम वाले ऐसे सिम्टम्स मिलेंगे सो टोटली सिम्टम्स आर डिफरेंट एंड दिस इज अ टिपिकल सिम्टम सीन इन फ्रे सिंड्रोम सो फ्रे सिंड्रोम वी से इट इज ड्यू टू द सर्जरी और पैरेटेड ग्लैंड आफ्टर दैट द पेशेंट कंप्लेन्ट्स ऑफ दिस इंजरी ऑफ ऑरिकुलर टेम्पोरल नर्व विच इज अ ब्रांच ऑफ मैंडिबुलर एंड द टिपिकल कंप्लेट इज रेडनेस फ्लशिंग स्वेटिंग इंक्रीज टेम्परेचर ऑन द लेटरल एस्पेक्ट्स ऑफ चीक्स वेन ही इज ईटिंग so whenever he is eating it is not associated with the spiciness of food even if he eats sweet food or salty food the symptoms will be present okay so this is what this is the phrase syndrome <clears throat> so the answer over here is a auriculo temporal nerve now as we have discussed one more nerve just now let us see this question now this is a question which is again one of the highly expected questions for you because this is the most upcoming uh, nerve injury which is being asked last two papers it has come and this is a very highly expected question it can be highly repeated like highly expectedly repeated question so let us see what is the question over here i have not um, this is a very easy form of this question let us read it a patient can never close his left eye completely he is having difficulty in eating dribbling of saliva angle of mouth is tilted down on the left side everything is happening where everything is happening on the left side left side left side now when you see yes very very correct very very correct i can see a yes shubham daisy nigar rudhya rudra dishu hema ayush very correct very correct very correct <clears throat> काजल कौशल वेरी करेक्ट दिस इज वॉट इट इज अ फेशियल नर्व इंजरी एंड दे आर बेसिकली मैंशनिंग वॉट दे आर मैंशनिंग द बेल्स पैलसी द फेशियल नर्व इज वन ऑफ द अपकमिंग क्वेश्चन विच इज हाईली एक्सपेक्टेड इन योर एग्जाम एंड वॉट यू सी दिस इज द बेल्स पैलसी ऑल द सिम्टम्स ऑन द सेम साइट एंड वेन यू से बेल्स पैलसी वॉट इज द बेल्स पैलसी ऑल दीज सिम्टम्स दे अकर ऑन द सेम साइड इफ यू सी इन दिस पेशेंट दिस इज द नॉर्मल साइड दिस इज द साइड ऑफ बेल्स पैलसी फर्स्ट थिंग इज दैट फर्स्ट थिंग इज दैट लॉस ऑफ ट्रांसफर्स रिंगल्स ऑन द फोर हेड यू आज द पेशेंट टू मेक द फोर हेड यू आज द पेशेंट टू रेज द आईब्रोज सो वेन यू रेज द आईब्रोज ट्रांसफर्स रिंकल्स आर फॉर्म्ड on the normal side they are formed but on the bell's palsy side absent then you ask the patient to close eyes the patient will not be able to close the eyes on the affected side so inability to close inability to close the eyes on the affected side these are the two symptom then you say nasolabial fold which is present over here on the on the normal side but it is absent on the affected side so loss of nasolabial fold another is accumulation of food over here so whenever we say accumulation of food over here this is again on the affected side due to this dribbling of saliva also on the affected side so all the symptoms on the affected side as well as what we say is angle of mouth is tilted down now whenever you are asking uh, whenever you are answering on this angle of the mouth there are two types of statements mentioned one statement is <coughs> ओके सॉरी इन बिटवीन सो वन टाइप ऑफ स्टेटमेंट इज द एंगल ऑफ द माउथ इज स्लाइटली टिल्टेड डाउन नाउ एंगल ऑफ द माउथ वेन इट इज स्लाइटली टिल्टेड डाउन इट इज ऑन द सेम साइड नाउ वॉट हैपन्स ऑन दिस साइड ऑल द मसल्स आर पैरलाइज एंड ऑन द नॉर्मल साइड वॉट हैपन्स दे ट्राई टू पुल द फेस टूवर्ड्स दैमसेल्फ एंड वेन दे आर ट्राइंग टू पुल द फेस टूवर्ड्स दैमसेल्फ द फेस इज पुल्ड टूवर्ड्स अ नॉर्मल साइड सो समाइम्स दे right in the uh, in the theory point or in the options that the angle of the mouth is shifted or deviated towards the normal side so you have to understand these two statement do statement hai ek statement hai ki angle of mouth unhone bola ki tilt down niche ki taraf tilt ho gaya wo same side pe hai aur normal side pe kya hai normal side jo hoti hai wo face ko pura apni taraf khinchti hai kyunki wo normal muscles hai jab wo face ko pura apni taraf khinchegi to uske liye statement ho jayega the face is shifted to the normal side or the angle of the mouth is shifted or deviated to the normal side so you should be aware of these two statement both the statements are correct okay both the statements are correct 
So I'm just telling you because these kind of statements are written in the questions. Now, whenever you are talking about <clears throat> the uh, facial nerve injury, you should be aware that there are two types, upper and the low motor neuron. The upper motor neuron is supranuclear lesion above the nucleus, the fibers which are coming from the cerebrum. And the LMN is nuclear lesion or infranuclear lesion, be, uh, the fibers which are after the nucleus. In the upper motor neuron, what is the effect? Sparing of the forehead muscles and the contralateral lower half of the face is paralyzed. But when you compare it with the LMN, <clears throat> it is what? It is the ipsilateral whole half of the face is paralyzed. Means whole half is gone including the forehead. It is known as Bell's palsy. Now in this also sometimes they ask you the question in detail. So you should be uh, prepared for that also. When we say facial nerve, the facial nerve is starting from facial nucleus passes through internal equestic matus, then uh, through, uh, in this region, <clears throat> in this region it is present in the ear, in the middle ear, then it comes out of the middle ear by stylomestered foramen and finally it reaches towards the face. Now within the middle ear it is giving three branches, the greater petrosal nerve, nerve to stapedius and the corda tympani nerve. Now sometimes what they say, whenever we are talking about this Bell's palsy, the Bell's palsy is the lesion over here. When you say lesion over here of the nerve, the lesion of the facial nerve when it comes outside towards the face, it leads to Bell's palsy. Now sometimes there is a question, they, are, they say that lesion is proximal to or it is before the origin of corda tympani nerve. So if the lesion is over here before the origin of corda tympani nerve, so in that case you will see Bell's palsy also and the symptoms of involvement of corda tympani nerve also. So means the symptoms are added. So if the lesion is here, you will get Bell's palsy ke symptom and if the lesion is a little up, then the corda tympani nerve will affect the symptoms of the symptoms bhi extra milenge. What is that? If it is involved in loss of taste sensation on entire two-third of tongue. Similarly, if the lesion goes more higher up, so the nerve of stapedius is also affected, it leads to what? Hyperacusis. So one more extra symptom is seen, hyperacusis. If the lesion goes more higher up, then one more symptom, one more nerve is affected, greater petrosal nerve. And then we say one more symptom is added, what? loss of lacrimation. So this is like sometimes they ask you a detailed question which for which you should be prepared. Why? Because a facial nerve is a favorite question or the topic for the examiner at present. So you should be aware of this point also. Right. So this is for the facial nerve injury. We know now the answer over here is a facial nerve. Now let us come to the next question. Now let us read the next question. A patient had extraction of what? <clears throat> it is extraction of the third molar tooth. Now, whenever you are talking about the third molar tooth, for this we say it is related to a nerve. It is related to the lingual nerve. Okay, it is related to the lingual nerve. This is the lingual nerve. And now let us read the further question after this. After the extraction, it has been observed that there is a what? Yes, loss of sensation. From where? From anterior two-third of tongue as well as the floor of the mouth. Now when you say anterior two-third of tongue, so you very well know for the anterior two-third of tongue, two nerves are supplying the anterior two-third. The general sensation, lingual nerve. Taste sensation, what? Yes, it is a corda tympani nerve. So whenever we are talking about the anterior two-third, so when you say sensory supply of tongue, the general sensa sensation for the anterior two-third, lingual, taste by corda tympani. For the posterior one-third and circumvallic papilla, both type of sensations are carried by glossopharyngeal nerve. And for the posterior most part, again both type of sensations, they are carried by vagus nerve or the internal laryngeal nerve. So now, over here we say most of the quotients are focused on this point. So you should be knowing this point very well. Either they ask you a question about lingual nerve or they ask you a question on corda tympani nerve. The lingual nerve question has already been asked. Either it can be repeated or they can ask you a question on corda tympani. Now when they will say corda tympani nerve is affected, what will happen? Now you can yourself say taste sensation of anterior two-third of the tongue will be gone. So when corda tympani nerve will go, what will Symptom will milega aapko loss of taste sensation where anterior two-third of the tongue. Now let us come back to the question. 
one keyword over here third molar tooth and a very very easy key point over here anterior two third of the tongue sensory loss they have not specified taste when they have not specified taste that means we have to go by default general sensation is gone we will take it as general sensation gone and now we say this is due to the lingual nerve as well as the floor of the mouth is supplied by lingual nerve so all the points they favor towards the lingual nerve so the answer of this question is lingual nerve when you say about the other nerves they are totally different uh, nerves when you talk about hypoglossal the hypoglossal nerve supplies muscles of the tongue it supplies the muscles of the tongue and for the muscles of the tongue it is supplying the muscles of the tongue and a very specific symptom for the hypoglossal nerve injury is there deviation of tongue on same side of lesion this is a very specific symptom the deviation of the tongue occurs on the same side of lesion so this kind of symptoms will be mentioned accessory nerve spinal accessory nerve we are just going to discuss uh, in this uh, session only and when we say inferior alveolar nerve so accessory nerve supplies the trapezius muscle and sternocleidomastoid we will discuss later and inferior alveolar nerve supplies the lower teeth so totally it is a different supply so the answer over here is the lingual now now let us come to the next question question number 9 now this is regarding the rupture of the urethra very great so this is regarding the rupture of the urethra urethral injuries and during the accident the urethral injury is there extra vasation of the urine on examination it was observed that the extra vasation of the urine it reaches till what point the keyword over here is anterior abdominal wall the urine is going till the anterior abdominal wall so which portion of the urethra is most likely to be injured it is most likely to be injured so when we are talking about the urethral injuries there are two urethral injuries mainly one is bulbar urethral another is the membranous now when you talk about the bulbar urethral injury this is the injury in which superficial extravasation of the urine occurs superficial extravasation matlab urine collection outer side pe hota hai bahar ki taraf hota hai aur membranous urethral injury the deep extravasation of urine occurs means all the urine collection is in the deeper aspect so if we if we see this image over here this is the image which is showing the ruptured bulbar urethra the ruptured bulbar urethra the bulbar urethra is from here till this point this is the this is the spongy urethra over here and in that also we say the bulbar urethra is present specifically at this location so this is the location of bulbar urethra when it is ruptured the urine collection is towards the outer side first of all the urine goes where the urine first of all goes into this area what is it superficial perineal pouch so what you have to remember over here is that bulbar you remember one thing over here bulbar superficial if you remember this word that bulbar is what it is superficial so once if you remember bulbar superficial you will remember that all the collection of the urine occurs towards the outer side towards the superficial side so therefore the superficial perineal pouch whatever further urine is there it is going towards the outer side it collects in the scrotum and then it corrects uh, in the penile region and finally it goes where it is you can see it is running now towards where it is running towards the anterior abdominal wall so it is running towards the interior abdominal wall so over here all the collection of urine is towards the outer side and in the bulbar urethral injury the urine can go till the anterior abdominal wall in opposite of this membranous will be what agar bulbar superficial bola hai to membranous ho jayega deep so membranous urethral rupture all the urine collection is in the deeper aspect this is this is the location of the membranous urethra and whenever the urine is leaking from there the urine goes in the deeper aspect and we say in the membranous urethral rupture the urine goes into the deep perineal pouch around the prostate this is around the prostate over here or around the urinary bladder it is collected over here so these are the two differences over here in this mostly the urethral injury which occurs is bulbar urethral and that is the one which is usually asked more so therefore the answer of this question is bulbar urethra for the anti abdominal wall this is a keyword anti abdominal wall is keyword for bulbar urethral injury so keep working hard you can get anything 
दैट यू वॉन्ट इसमें एक एक्सेप्शन भी है एक्सेप्शन है गर्लफ्रेंड सब मिल सकता है दुनिया में बट यू नो कि एक्सेप्शन विच आई सेट बट पढ़ाई में अगर आप फुल एफर्ट डालोगे तो पढ़ाई में सक्सेस तो पक्का मिलेगा उसकी गारंटी है पक्का मिलेगा और एफर्ट का मतलब वर्किंग हार्ड का मतलब कि उस पॉइंट तक आपको पहुंचना है कि जब आपको लगे कि भाई मैंने इतनी मेहनत तो जिंदगी में नहीं पढ़ी इतनी मेहनत मैंने जिंदगी में नहीं की इतनी पढ़ाई मैंने कभी लाइफ में की नहीं जब आपको ये लगे तो दैट मीन्स यू आर गोइंग इन द राइट डायरेक्शन सो कीप वर्किंग हार्ड एंड यू विल डेफिनेटली यू विल बी एबल टू डू इट डेफिनेटली एंड रीच टू अ पॉइंट try to reach to a point when you feel that i have never studied so much so that is that point means that you are going in a right direction and you can get anything you want okay you can get anything you want so let us come to the next question quickly during the examination <clears throat> during the examination when a patient was asked to stand on Okay, what is written over here? On, on, on left foot, the drop of right hip was observed. Now, which nerve is paralyzed in this case? Now, what happens? Everybody knows this question. Everybody knows uh, what is uh, what will happen over here. But the point comes is trick is right, left, right, left. That is the trick. Right है ये left है. उसको answer करने में ही गड़बड़ होती है. So you have to take care. Whenever the gluteal nerve injury question is there. superior gluteal nerve injury question whenever the gluteus medius or minimus injury question is there paralysis question is there what you have to see in this question is what you have to focus on this question is on which foot the person is standing kaun se foot pe patient khada hai jis foot pe patient stand kar raha hai usi side ki nerve gayi hai aur usi side ki medius or minimus gayi this is how you can answer the question quickly so whenever you are reading this question just see on which foot he is standing wherever whatever foot he is standing that is the side which nerve is gone as well as on that side only the medius gluteus medius and the gluteus minimus are paralyzed so he if he stands on the left foot the right foot the right side hip is dropped this is what this is a trendelberg sign <clears throat> so if i say if this is the left side the person is standing on the left foot over here and there is a drop where the drop is towards the right side the hip is dropping towards the right side. so the hip or the pelvis drops to the opposite side of the injury and the superior gluteal nerve of this side is affected the superior gluteal nerve of this side is affected as well as medius and minimus of this side is paralyzed means if it is standing on the left foot the left gluteus medius and minimus are paralyzed and the left superior gluteal nerve injury is there and due to this what happens the pelvis falls to opposite side the sign is positive and the patient is having which type of walking gait lurching gait it is given the term as lurching gait very correct very correct so now over here when we are talking about if i come back to the question now what can be the answer of this question let us quickly try to answer the question over here yes yes very correct many have answered a then a lot of few have answered b then d also see the medius and minimus they are supplied by superior gluteal nerve so this is not the answer you have to basically choose between the two and as i said left foot he is standing on the left foot so the answer of this question is what the answer is left superior gluteal nerve injury this is the answer of this question okay so this is a left superior gluteal nerve injury and the left gluteus medius and the minimus they are paralyzed now if i come to the next question <clears throat> this is the question for the lower limb now we are doing the questions of the lower limb over here now this is another question which is a uh, like um, a commonly asked question any of the question can come from this let us discuss this question if you are able to do this question you can do all the questions related to the leg area now when we are doing this type of questions you will say ki okay, ma'am we are doing <clears throat> clinical questions clinical integrated question but let me tell you along with the clinical integrated questions you are also getting prepared for the one liners and you can now answer the clinical integrated questions to wo kehte na ek teer do nishane to yahan pe ek teer se kai nishane lag rahe hain clinical question tha mai practice kar hi rahe hain usko samajh rahe hain uske sath sath jitne bhi one liners hain that you can answer very easily so over here what is the question read it carefully slightly tricky question i have made it slightly tricky so that 
you are able to understand that how the question can be twisted. First thing is patient presence with loss of dorsiflexion of the foot. Okay, loss of dorsiflexion, dorsiflexion is gone. Minimal sensory loss. Minimal sensory loss, very good. I can see a lot of a lot of you are trying to respond very, very good. Great. So <clears throat> minimal sensory loss we are between the great toe and adjacent toe. Then on examination, what do you see on examination? The eversion and the plantar flexion, they are what? Normal, they are normal. The eversion and the plantar flexion is normal. So that means only the loss of dorsiflexion is there and a very small sensory loss is there. Now when we are trying to answer this question, very correct, very correct, foot drop. Yashank, very correct, foot drop and everybody is answering it very correctly, Daisy, Minal. Now when you are talking about the shaitik now, <clears throat> let us see this flow chart. Okay, when you see this flowchart, what do you see? Shaitik nerve divides into tibial, common peroneal. The common peroneal winds around the neck of fibula and again it divides into deep peroneal and the superficial peroneal. The deep peroneal is a nerve for anterior compartment of leg and the superficial is the nerve for lateral compartment of leg. When you say tibial nerve, the tibial nerve over here is a nerve for the posterior compartment of leg. Now this flowchart is very, very important for you if you want to answer any question related to leg area. So either it is a one-liner or it is a clinical question, you can answer all the questions related to it. Now when you say anterior compartment, the main action of the anterior compartment is what? It is mainly helping in the dorsiflexion. And the posterior compartment, it helps in the plantar flexion. And when you say lateral compartment, it mainly helps you in the eversion. Okay, these are the main actions which are done by these compartments. Now apart from this, if I say sensory supply, these nerves are also having the sensory supply. The deep perineal nerve you can see is supplying this much area only and what is this area? This area is this area is the space or the area between the great toe and the adjacent toe. Okay, great toe and the adjacent toe, this is the first web space. So a very small area in this location supplied by deep perineal nerve. Please take care, this is what sensory supply take care this is a sensory supply to the skin not muscles this is a sensory supply then after that the other majority of the area is supplied by superficial peroneal nerve which is also going towards the lateral aspect of the leg so all this area is supplied by superficial peroneal nerve and if you say tibial nerve that that man, what about the tibial nerve the tibial nerve is supplying what i just mentioned earlier sole of the foot the skin of the sole of the foot and apart from this, if you see one more nerve, Safner's nerve is supplying the rest of the area, medial border of the foot and medial side of the leg. This Safner's nerve is actually a different nerve which is a branch of femoral nerve. Now for us, what is important? This one, very important and this one also. These two nerves are very, very important for sensory nerve supply. And over here again also we say, whenever you're doing any nerve injury questions, just see that sensory loss what sensory loss is mentioned according to that you can answer it quickly if the sensory loss is mentioned over here we say deep peroneal nerve is gone if the sensory loss is completely over here then you will say superficial peroneal nerve is gone fine now let us combine this and when we combine these all things what we say foot drop in the foot drop it can be due to two nerve injuries if it is common peroneal nerve injury in that the symptoms will be loss of dorsiflexion plus loss of eversion and a lot of sensory loss. This usually occurs due to the fracture at the neck of fibula and when only the involvement of deep, when only the involvement of deep perineal nerve is there, what will happen? Only the loss of dorsiflexion and a very less minimal sensory loss, very minimal sensory loss is there. And basically, if you remember this flowchart, you can answer any of the question. If I see this flowchart, if I say deep perineal nerve gone, so only this portion has gone. That is why only the loss of dorsiflexion. If I say common perineal nerve gone, so if the common perineal nerve is gone, complete area is affected. So that is why loss of dorsiflexion also, loss of eversion also. And if I say complete shatic nerve is gone, then complete leg area is gone. So according to the flowchart, you can answer any of the nerve injuries. So this is over here. Now we have understood that the answer of this question is what? Deep peroneal nerve. And not only this, now you can answer any of the nerve injuries over here. 
in fact you can answer for the saphenous nerve also saphenous nerve we have mentioned over here it is a branch of humeral nerve which is supplying skin which area the rest of the area whatever area is left it is supplied by the saphenous nerve on the medial side so this is one of the nerve injuries over here now let us come to one more question over here you can see what is this image this is the image of diaphragm this is the image of diaphragm these three landmarks have been shown over here so let us see what are the three landmarks now i will just help you in the question except is written over here okay so you have to answer correctly all the statements are correct except you have to tell except so um, like you as you are reading the question let us first of all identify the structures over here now when you see this image over here so we very well say this whitish area over here is central tendon and when you say central tendon whatever opening is present in the central tendon what is this this is vena cava opening okay a is vena cava opening now after that the brown area is what it is the muscular part it is a muscular part any opening which is present in the brown area this is what esophageal opening this is the esophageal opening then on the posterior side the c option which is uh, mentioned over here this is the crus okay this is the crus of the uh, of the uh, diaphragm over here which is attached to the lumbar vertebra over here and when you see this opening over here between the two crus okay these are the two crus and this opening over here which is mentioned as b is aortic opening so all these are the structures over here yes voice of america so v o you can say this is o for esophageal opening and a so we say v o a from the anterior side to posterior side v o a or voice of america from anterior to the posterior side and now we have understood what is a a is vena cava opening b is aortic opening c is crus and now let us see <clears throat> now you can read the question very well shubham now you can read the question don't worry i have come again to the question so a we have understood is vena cava opening b is aortic opening and c is the crus now let us see the question now you can read the question and let us see i will read the question along with you a gives passage to esophagus this is not correct a is vena cava opening it cannot gives passage to the esophagus vena cava opening gives passage to inferior vena cava right phrenic nerve then when you say b what is b what is b yes b is aortic opening it gives passage to aorta thoracic duct azygous vein so yes this is correct c c is crus crus is attached to yes this is the lumbar vertebra this is also correct it is attached to the lumbar vertebra b let us see b what is b o b the b gives passage to the phrenic nerve in fact this is also wrong so basically like uh, i think while i was uh, making the question two options went wrong so the answer of this question should be what the answer of this question should be a and the d also okay because we are saying all the statements are correct except so b actually is giving passage to aorta and we say thoracic duct as well as azygous vein so by mistake there are two answers in this question a as well as d so when we see that what is passing through these different structures so vena cava opening giving passage to these two structure at the level of t8 esophageal opening at the level of t10 giving passage to esophagus vagus nerve left gastric artery esophageal branches and the aortic opening at the level of t12 giving passage to these three structures so they by the answer of this question is two questions the answer of this question is two question uh, so two options d also and a also okay a and d so now the diaphragm question also is very very important for you which is a repeated question and one of the expected question which can come as a new question for you is pharyngeal apparatus and when you see this image this image has not been asked till now it can come as a new question okay when you say like a new question aa gaya are ye to new question aa gaya is paper mein so it can come as a new question and before i come to this question first of all we will understand the image then i will come back to the question okay 
let us understand this image. What is this? This is a pharyngeal apparatus image. In the center, this complete area is oral cavity. Okay, whatever area has been shown in this light brown area is oral cavity. And on the sides, you are having the arches. So when you say arches, this is first arch. This is the first arch. This is the second. This is the third. This is the fourth. And this is the sixth. Similarly, on the other side, one, two, three, four, six. So whatever this uh, brown colored area over here is there. Whatever this brown colored area is over here, one, two, three, four, six. Now, when you see from the outer side, it is covered by a blue colored layer, which is a depression from the outer side. It is actually the ectoderm which is covering it. Arches are made up of mesoderm. And when you see the outer covering over here, this is the ectoderm which is covering. And these depressions over here are what? Ectodermal clefts or the pharyngeal cleft. So now when you are talking about this cleft over here, this B is first pharyngeal cleft. And when you are talking about the first cleft, this is the first cleft, this is the second cleft, this is the third cleft and this is the fourth cleft. These are the depressions from outside. A option we have already mentioned first pharyngeal arch. A is the first pharyngeal arch. B is the first pharyngeal cleft. And now when you see C and D, C and D are the arrows from inside. So inside are the pouches. You get endodermal pouches. Endodermal pouches or you say pharyngeal pouches. So on the inside, this yellow colored layer is shown as endoderm and it is having depressions over here and now when you see the depressions over here let me show in some other color this is one this is two this is three and this is four one two three four depressions from inside and what are these these are all pharyngeal pouch so now whenever this image is given what is main for you is that you should be able to identify the numbering the numbering of arches, 1, 2, 3, 4, 6. On the outer side, clefts, 1, first depression, 1, 2, 3, 4. Then the depressions from inside, depressions from inside, 1, 2, 3, 4. These are the pouches. So now when you see A is first pharyngeal arch, B is first pharyngeal cleft, C is second pharyngeal pouch, D is third pharyngeal pouch and whenever you are talking about the pouches over here the pouches we say that second pharyngeal pouch this has been marked over here it gives rise to palatine tonsil and tonsillar fossa and the third pouch is very very important which gives <coughs> rise to the thymus and the inferior parathyroid gland so second and third pouch are forming these structures. The first arch is forming a lot of structures in which we say the predominant letter is always M. All the structures starting from M, they are formed by first arch. And when you say first pharyngeal cleft, according to the latest editions of embryology books, no significant structure is formed by first pharyngeal cleft. Okay. So let us come, let us come to this question over here now. What is correct statement. You can read the question and you are getting ample time to read the question. So let us read the question over here. Correct statement. You have to choose the correct statement. A. A is first arch. You, have, you know this is the first arch. So it says A forms sphenomandibular ligament. Very correct. This is correct. A forms sphenomandibular ligament. B. B we have mentioned first cleft. It is not forming any significant structure. B not. Stapes is formed by second arch. Now C. Let us come to the C over here. So C is what? C was second pouch. It is not forming the thymus. It is actually forming what? It is forming the palatine tonsil. And the D is third pouch. So D is not forming the in the D forms okay again. The D is forming the inferior parathyroid gland. Again, this is correct. I think like during forming the questions, some I like got mistake with the incorrect and correct. So sorry for that. Again, for this question, we are having two answers A and D. 
the d is the third pharyngeal pouch the third pharyngeal pouch is forming the thymus as well as the inferior parathyroid gland so again over here you are having two answers okay a and d so the correct statement over here is that the first arch is forming the sphenomandibular ligament then also the d the d is the third pouch which is forming the inferior parathyroid gland so the basic point over here is that in this image you should be able to identify the correct structures and if you are able to identify the correct structure you are able to answer it correctly and in this you should be knowing that uh, in the pouches very important is second and the third pouch that it is giving rise to what structures and therefore the answer over here is again two answers sorry for that so it is a and d yeah again one more dil mange more ek answer se kaam nahi chal raha tha dil mange more so let us come to the next question over here <clears throat> Now let us see this question over here. A fifty years old male complaining of nausea, dizziness. I am just giving you a hint. This is a question of neuronotpy. And if you see the syndromes word is written. So, जैसे ही syndromes word देखते हो ना तो क्या होता है ना दिमाग के ना ऐसा लगता है कि bulb fuse हो गए. तो जैसे ही neuronotpy का question आता है और syndromes पढ़ते हो. Don't be afraid. You can answer it. you can answer it and after we will be discussing you will be able to answer the questions so the pay, the complaints are nausea dizziness difficulty in speaking eating difficulty in walking on the right side with loss of temperature and pain pain and temperature sensations from limbs and trunk what is the likely diagnosis what is the likely diagnosis which artery can be involved now this is a neuroanatomy question and what do you see medullary syndrome so basically you have to decide that which medullary syndrome is there it is a medial or it is a lateral medullary syndrome and once you decide then you can tell that which artery has undergone occlusion so very correct i can see a lot of questions a b options are a b yes uh, pica the pica is there now for this first of all we will see the syndrome the two type of syndrome over here the lateral medullary the lateral medullary syndrome is also known as wallenberg both are same and now this question it has not been asked till now it can come as a new question a very important question which has been which has not been asked so lateral and the wallenberg they are the same and whenever you are seeing the symptoms so first of all you say pica the pica is occluded which is posterior inferior cerebellar artery <clears throat> and whenever you are seeing the symptoms a multiple symptoms can be seen and question will be of the length of 8 or 9 lines so when you see multiple symptoms all the multiple symptoms everything is there in the patient nausea dizziness giddiness he is not able to walk he is not able to eat he is not able to speak plus there is contralateral loss of pain and temperature so multiple symptoms plus contralateral loss of pain and temperature so when this kind of presentation is there it is the lateral medullary or the wallenberg so multiple symptoms with pto multiple symptoms with pto pto is what pto is p is pain t is temperature o is opposite side so the pain and temperature is lost where it is lost on the opposite side so we we say multiple symptoms plus pto pto is pain temperature lost wear on the opposite side so this is for the wallenberg or the lateral medullary which is one of the very very important question and you should be able to differentiate with medial medullary which is occlusion of anterior spinal artery and <clears throat> in this specifically the cranial nerve 12 involvement is there which is a key point when you are like answering the question if the cranial of 12 injury or the involvement not injury if the cranial of 12 involvement is mentioned then you think about medial medullary the other symptom seen is hemiplegia on the contralateral side and the loss of conscious proprioception and vibration on the contralateral side but the key point will remain as cranial nerve 12 involvement okay that is a cranial nerve 12 involvement for the medial medullary so if i come back to the question over here now you can answer the question very well this is what this is the lateral medullary syndrome and the artery gone is pica the lateral medullary syndrome is also known as wallenberg syndrome so that means we can exclude these two options and we have to choose between two 
द लेटल मेडलरी वॉलनबर्ग आर्टरी गॉन पाइका सो दे फॉर द आंसर ऑफ दिस क्वेश्चन इज दिस वन ओके द आंसर ऑफ दिस क्वेश्चन इज वॉलनबर्ग सो वॉलनबर्ग लेटल मेडलरी इट इज द सेम वर्ड एंड द आर्टरी गॉन इज पाइका okay the artery gone is pica so these are the two medullary syndrome you should be able to differentiate between the two medullary syndrome and whenever you see the image of the arteries over here the same question can be asked you with the help of the image they can put the arrow over here and they can say the occlusion of this artery has led to a syndrome which is again what it is wallenberg because this artery is what it is the pica and its occlusion leads to what wallenberg syndrome and when you talk about this artery this is anterior spinal artery so these two artery is very very important to identify in the image the same question can be asked in a image based question now in the neuroanatomy we have understood these two questions over here the medial and the lateral medullary another type of syndrome which can be asked is what is the next question now let us see the next question over here you can see now all the syndromes are mentioned over here okay all the syndromes are mentioned now <clears throat> when you see the question over here when you see the question over here what is it patient presents with hemiplegia on the right side hemiplegia on the right side loss of fine touch on the right side with loss of pain and temperature on opposite side pain and temperature is gone on opposite side that is the left side no cranial nerve involvement is there no cranial nerve involvement so what can it be now what do you see multiple symptoms are not present मल्टीपल सिम्टम्स आर नॉट मल्टीपल सिम्टम है ही नहीं इसके देर आर थ्री स्पेसिफिक सिम्टम वन टू थ्री एंड वेन यू सी सच थ्री स्पेसिफिक सिम्टम्स ओवर हेयर वी से वॉट इज इट इट इज अ ब्राउन सिक्विड सिंड्रोम दीज आर कैरेक्टरिस्टिकली फॉर द ब्राउन सिक्विड सिंड्रोम सो वेन एवर यू आर टॉकिंग अबाउट द ब्राउन सिक्विड सिंड्रोम वॉट यू सी देर थ्री सिम्टम्स ओवर हेयर ipsilateral hemiplegia ipsilateral loss of conscious proprioception and vibration and contralateral loss of pain and temperature due to the involvement of these straps and this is what hemisection of the spinal cord when you compare it with the weber syndrome specifically over here again a cranial nerve is affected whenever you will read the question it will be mentioned cranial nerve 3 affected it is a cranial nerve 3 which is affected and along with that same side cranial 3 involvement along with that contralateral hemiplegia the key word for the fevers is cranial nerve 3 involvement so these are the four syndromes which are like uh, usually everybody is confused in this ki how to answer or jaise abhi char syndrome dekhte ho na question mein to pehle hi dimag ghum jata hai ki yaar kya hoga ye to question hi mushkil hoga no 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 if these four syndromes are there then you should now think that this is the good question for you this is a bonus question for you because you already know it so how you will answer the question whenever these four syndromes are mentioned first of all you should be knowing lateral is wallenberg and you remember in the wallenberg two time l is coming so that is why l for lateral medullary a trick to memorize it wallenberg mein do bar l aa raha hai to l se ho gaya lateral medullary and when you say wallenberg we have said multiple symptoms multiple vague symptoms plus pto this is to identify the question okay this is a trick that how you will answer the question when you say medial medullary the trick to answer it that there should be cranial nerve 12 involvement there should be cranial nerve 12 involvement mentioned in the question similarly for the weber syndrome they should have mentioned the cranial nerve 3 involvement So these are the keywords for the other syndromes, and when you say brown sequet syndrome, for the brown sequet syndrome, we can see the three type of symptoms are there: two same side symptom, and again pain and temperature is on the opposite side. So <clears throat> these are the four syndromes which we mention over here, and uh, now we know that how to answer this. And whenever you are talking about the brown sequet syndrome over here, also I will tell you a very easy trick to answer it. The easy trick to answer over here is. a mnemonic which i will mention to you hi fi pto for the brown sequet syndrome you are going to memorize with a mnemonic hi fi pto so this is how you are going to answer all the syndromes together wallenberg multiple syndrome plus pto cranial of 12 medial medullary cranial of 3 webers and hi fi pto is for the brown sequet syndrome how it is the mnemonic 
वेरी वेरी इजी हाई इज एच इज हेमीप्लेजिया एच इज हेमीप्लेजिया आई इज इप्सिलेटर F is so we say high is hemiplegia, high is ipsilateral. So ipsilateral loss of or ipsilateral hemiplegia C. Okay, ipsilateral hemiplegia. And when I say phi, phi means fine touch. The fine touch is gone. Where again it is on ipsilateral side. Again it is on the ipsilateral side. So ipsilateral hemiplegia, ipsilateral fine touch gone. And PTO you already know what we said. PTO P is pain. T is temperature and we already mentioned o is what o is opposite so we already said pain temperature opposite side so if you remember by this mnemonic it will become very easy for you to answer this question you can make this difficult question easy high phi pto high hemiplegia same side ipsilateral phi means fine touch gone on same side ipsilateral pto you already know pain temperature opposite so this is for the brown sequet syndrome this is for the brown sequet syndrome and therefore the answer of this question is brown sequet to mushkil nahi hai kus duniya mein mushkil nahi hai kus duniya mein tu zara himmat to kar mushkil nahi hai kus duniya mein tu zara himmat to kar khwab badlenge haqeeqat mein khwab badlenge haqeeqat mein tu zara koshish to kar to koshish koshish hi karni hai aapko thodi si koshish aur इतनी मेहनत आपने इतनी मेहनत की है थोड़ी सी कोशिश और कुछ दिन बचे हैं कुछ दिन भी नहीं बहुत सारे दिन बचे हैं इसके अंदर आप कहते हैं ना कि पूरी किस्मत को पलट सकते हो अगर प्रिपरेशन अभी तक थोड़ी स्लो थी उसको फास्ट करके किस्मत पलट सकते हो तो थोड़ी सी कोशिश कर हार मत मान कोशिश कर so let us come to the next question over here question number 16 again this is a very highly expected question for you what is the name of the vertebral level and <clears throat> what is the name and the vertebral level of the colored plane in the image what is the name and the vertebral level for the red colored plane in the image red colored plane is this one now this is a very very highly expected question because it has been coming in the three papers it has already come in the three papers every time they are changing the question so very very highly expected question over here and now before we answer the question i will just come back to this i will just come back to this question let us see first of all this in the quadrants bilkul sahi kaha aapne rahi lifestyle koshish pe duniya chal rahi hai mam kya baat hai zabardast मैम कैसे करें ये तो बता दो कोशिश पढ़ो मेहनत करो कोशिश करो कोशिश पे जैसे उसने कहा ना कोशिश पे तो दुनिया कायम है कोशिश ये करनी पढ़ने की कोशिश करनी है ठीक है ये नहीं कोशिश करनी कि क्या करें क्या करें सोचना नहीं है पढ़ना है कोशिश करनी है पढ़ने की द मोस्ट डिफिकल्ट टास्क ऑन दिस वर्ल्ड इज टू स्टडी एंड दैट इज वाई very few doctors and you are द प्रिवलेज डॉक्टर्स एंड दैट इज वाई द डॉक्टर्स आर कंसिडर्ड एज अ हाईली इंटेलिजेंट पीपल so actually they are the highly intelligent because they study so much none other profession is studying so much so let us come over here quickly if i say quadrants the quadrants is in the abdominal quadrants there are two vertical lines mid clavicular two horizontal lines first is subcostal second is transtubercular very very important this one subcostal which is what is the vertebral level the vertebral level is upper border of l3 transtubercular lower border सॉरी अपर बॉर्डर ऑफ एल फाइव ठीक है दिस इज एल थ्री दिस इज एल फाइव सो इफ आई कम बैक टू दिस इमेज दिस इज द लोकेशन ऑफ अम्बलाइकस अम्बलाइकस यू नो इज एट द लेवल ऑफ वॉट अम्बलाइकस इज एट द लेवल ऑफ एल फो सब कोस्टल प्लेन एल थ्री ट्रांसटर्कुलर प्लेन एल फाइव ऑल द थ्री स्ट्रक्चर्स टूगेदर एल थ्री एल फो एल फोर दिस इज अम्बलाइकस okay this is i am i am mentioning umbilicus and this one is transtubercular so you should be very well able to answer this and both the planes for both the planes which border for both the planes it is upper border this is also upper border this is also upper border so for both the planes it is upper border now apart from these two planes there are two more planes what are the two other planes the two other planes over here is this one these are the two other planes now one is transpaleuric which is the lower border of l1 
Another is the supra crystal plane, which is a which is L4, and again this is lower border. When you say supra crystal plane, this is a plane passing through the highest point of iliac crest. Already the question has come on subcostal plane, transtubercular, supra crystal. Either they can be repeated or they can ask a new question on transpyloric. So <clears throat> when you say how to identify the transpyloric and the supra crystal. Let us see this image. If you see, this is the bony pelvis. This is the highest point of iliac crest. Okay, this is the iliac crest over here. And I'm dr I've drawn a plane passing through the highest point of iliac crest. And now this is the supra crystal plane. Right, this is a supra crystal plane. It is a supra crystal plane, and when I say supra crystal plane, now we know that it is uh, at uh, what level? So supra crystal plane, as we have mentioned above, it is at the lower border of L4. So supra crystal plane at level L4, lower border. Another border over here, which you should be able to identify in this image, is another plane over here is this one. This is what transpyloric. Now, when you say transpyloric plane, this is at the level of L1. Again, it is the lower border of L1. So now there are two images. Whenever they will give you this image, in this image, they will ask you these two planes. If the image is higher up, if the plane is higher up, transpyloric. If the plane is lower down at the highest point of iliac crest, supracrystal. So it is L1 and L4. Another image for the planes is this one. When they ask you this plane, in this you have two planes, subcostal, transtubercular. This is the image for quadrant, so two planes over here. So these are the two images you, in which you should be able to identify the planes. One is this image, another is this image. And now let us come back to the question over here. Now you can answer it very well. So now you can answer it very well. Let us see. Yes, dear Jyoti, God, may God bless our hard work, really. I also wish for that. So let us see over here what can be the answer of this question. When you see this question, this plane is subcostal. And that means either the answer is this or this. You can easily exclude the other two. Now, we have just mentioned subcostal plane is at the level of L3 and upper border of L3. So therefore, the answer of this question is this one. So this is the answer of the question that is A. Yes, very correct. So this is the answer of this question over here. A, subcoastal plane, upper border of L3. Yes, very nice. So over here we have identified subcoastal. Now we also know the trans tubercular. We also know the trans pyloric. We also know the supra crystal. Over here this question, the answer was subcoastal at the level of L3 upper border of L3 and for all the planes you should be knowing the vertebral level as well as you should be knowing the borders which border upper or the lower now let us come to another question this is another question which uh, again can be asked as a new question it has not been asked till now and there's a very high chances that this question can be asked it is a question on the congenital abnormalities in the systemic embryology so let us read this question the question is in the embryo at the sixth week of intrauterine life, the intestines herniate out, herniated out of the abdominal cavity at the level of umbilicus. And they did not return back at 10th week. The baby was born with intestinal loops present outside, covered by amniotic membrane. What is the most likely diagnosis? First of all, you have to tell the diagnosis. And then also you have to mention the pathogenesis, the reason for this. That what can be the reason for this. <clears throat> so I can see, yes, very correct, very correct. You all are going in a correct direction. Very correct. Now over here, before I reach to the answer, before I tell the answer, I will first of all explain to you. This is the omphalocele. Whenever you are answering this question, first of all, you should be knowing that omphalocele and exomphalos, same. These are the two same words. These are like same, these are the words for same congenital anomaly. And what is actually happening over here, in the sixth week of intrauterine life, the intestinal loops, they go outside the abdominal cavity at the level of umbilicus because the abdominal cavity is smaller. When the abdominal cavity becomes bigger, so the intestinal loops, they return back at the 10th week. 
and this is given the term as sixth week physiological hernia of the intestinal loop occurs and at the tenth week reduction of the physiological hernia occurs because they are returning back or we say return of the physiological hernia or we say reduction so pehle loops intestinal loops bahar jate hain usko physiological hernia kehte hain sixth week mein fir tenth week mein wapas aate hain usko kehte hain reduction of physiological hernia or return of the intestinal loops now if there is non deduction or non return if i say non deduction or non return of the midgut loop or non deduction of the physiological hernia so what will happen at the level of umbilicus the intestinal loops are present outside and specifically they are covered by amniotic membrane so this condition is known as omphalocele and this is the underlying pathogenesis that is the non return or non deduction of physiological hernia of the मिडगट तो सिंपल वर्ड्स में जो इंटेस्टिनल लूप्स थे वो वापस एबडोमिनल कैविटी में नहीं गए तो इसको हम कहेंगे नॉन रिटर्न या फिर नॉन डिडक्शन ऑफ द मिडगट नाउ सो नाउ व्हेन वी कम टू द क्वेश्चन ओवर हियर सो व्हाट वी सी दैट इट इज नॉट दिस नॉट दिस द आंसर इज आइदर ओम्फेलोसील और द एग्जोम्फेलोस एंड द करेक्ट आंसर ओवर हियर इज ओम्फेलोसील व्हिच इज अ नॉन रिडक्शन ऑफ फिजियोलॉजिकल हर्निया now when you see some more uh, congenital anomalies mentioned over here that is the gastroschisis what is gastroschisis in that the gastroschisis is what happens when the anti abdominal wall is formed the two folds come from either side and they fuse in the midline sometimes the fusion in the anti abdominal wall is defective it leads in a gap and when the child is born with the gap the intestinal loops will come out the difference over here in the gastroschisis is that not covered by amniotic membrane so the difference a big difference over here is that in the gastroschisis the intestinal loops are lying outside but they are not covered by the amniotic membrane and the defect is what the defect is in the anti abdominal wall formation so that is a totally different condition gastroschisis so over here we are focusing on the omphalocele which is a very very important question and omphalocele is one of the highly expected question yes very correct arun it is covered omphalocele covered by amniotic membrane now coming to a very very frequently asked question which we cannot leave any time it is a question to be covered always we can we can never leave this question because this is a very you say highly expected question and these are the transverse sections and the sagittal section questions are the most frequently asked questions so when you see this question it is let us try to answer this let us try to answer this question a and b so i will just zoom it for you <clears throat> the a landmark is over here b landmark is over here e a and b so when you say a and b what is a what is b yes uh, a lot of students are trying to answer it yes ayushi yukta taslim hema rudra madhumita very correct very correct very right so the answer over here is <coughs> d the answer over here is d and this is a question which every one of you should be able to answer jo question pata hai कि ये आ सकता है और आता है तो वो क्वेश्चन तो आपका गलत नहीं होना चाहिए सो वेन एवर वी आर टॉकिंग अबाउट सच क्वेश्चन सच काइंड ऑफ क्वेश्चन शुड नेवर गो रॉन्ग वेन यू सी द एरो ओवर हेयर दिस इज ऑन द स्ट्रक्चर प्रेजेंट ओवर हेयर वॉट इज दिस दिस इज द लोकेशन ऑफ द थैलमस एंड वेन यू सी द एरो बी इट इज बिटवीन द पॉन्स एंड द सेरी बेलम एंड दिस ट्राइंगुलर एरिया इन बिटवीन इज फोर्थ वेंट्रिकल एंड नाउ लेट एस सी द होल इमेज ओवर हेयर सो वेन वी टॉक अबाउट द होल इमेज दिस इज द इमेज image which is showing all the markings over here whenever you are talking about <clears throat> the c shaped structure over here this is what it is the corpus callosum the c shaped structure over here this one blue colored and from the c shaped structure there is a projection pink colored area which is known as fornix just below the pink colored area is t thalamus the thalamus is this region and below the t the area is h hypothalamus as you come below h pituitary gland it looks like as if a if a purse is hanging from above okay so these are the main structures over here then apart from that when you if the arrow is put between the corpus callosum and the fornix this is the location for lateral 
ventricle. This is a location of lateral ventricle. A part of the lateral ventricle can be seen over here. So between the corpus callosum and fornix is a lateral ventricle. Then as you come towards the lower side of the image, this is the complete brainstem. In the brainstem, we say this is a midbrain, this is big expanded portion pons, and this is a location of the medulla. So midbrain, pons, medulla, continues into spinal cord. Then between the pons and the cerebellum, you are having a triangular area, which is the fourth ventricle. Right? Now, uh, when you say pituitary gland and midbrain, between the two, there is a small round structure, which is known as what? Mammillary body. It is a mammillary body. One more structure which is very, very important over here is this one, pineal body. If the arrow is put just below the posterior part of corpus callosum. Okay, this is the corpus callosum. This is the corpus callosum over here. This is the posterior side of the image. And if the arrow is below, just below the posterior part of corpus callosum and you see some irregular structure or any structure, that is the pineal body. <clears throat> okay, that is the pineal body. And as you go below that, then you see the cerebellum. So pineal body, the location of the structure is over here. So this is the overall image showing all the important structures which you should be able to identify in the sagittal section over here. And therefore the answer is D. Let us, okay, before we go to the next question, again, the keywords for this present time is that keep the faith, keep working hard, great things will happen. And a very, very important thing is that Keep the faith. Vishwas rakho. Vishwas rakho man mein ki acha hoga to acha hoga. This time is tough. I know that this time period is tough. So you have to keep faith in yourself, in the notes which you have, in the faculties who are teaching you. Keep faith in that. And first of all, you have to keep faith in yourself. They say that if there is faith, everything is faith. If you have faith in yourself, that we will do it, we will do it. I can do it, then everything can happen. You know, miracles can happen. And miracles has happened. Miracles always they happen. So now let us come to the next question. <clears throat> As I say, ki miracles do happen because we have seen a lot of students when they re when they come for the classes on first day, they say, ma'am, we don't know anything. We have not studied at all. We have studied very less. We don't have any idea that what kind of questions will come. And we have seen such students clear in first attempt or in, if not in first attempt, they do clear it in second attempt. So miracles do happen. We have seen students clearing in the first attempt also. And those students who are not able to clear in first attempt, you should not feel bad. You have to keep trying till you achieve that point. अगर हार मान के पहले ही बैठ गए ना तो हार तो हो गई अगर कोशिश नहीं की तो हार पक्का है और अगर कोशिश की तो हार कभी भी जीत में बदल सकती है अगर आप जिंदगी में कुछ अलग चाहते हो तो अलग करना पड़ेगा लाइफ में अभी तक जो भी आपने लाइफ अभी तक देखी है जो भी आपने लाइफ में किया है तो अब लाइफ में थोड़ा सा कुछ डिफरेंट करना पड़ेगा क्योंकि आप कुछ नया पाना चाहते हो कुछ डिफरेंट पाना चाहते हो तो कुछ नया पाने के लिए कुछ डिफरेंट पाने के लिए कुछ अलग करना पड़ेगा इफ़ यू वांट एनीथिंग डिफरेंट इन योर लाइफ इफ़ यू वांट एनीथिंग न्यू इन लाइफ यू हैव टू डू सम डिफरेंट काइंड ऑफ एफर्ट्स यू हैव टू डू सम न्यू एफर्ट्स सो ना लेटर सी दिस क्वेश्चन आई कैन सी बहुत ही बढ़िया आई कैन सी द मैसेज फ्रॉम कमांडो मैम फर्स्ट मे ही बिल्कुल पेपर निकाल देंगे बहुत ही बढ़िया सो क्वेश्चन नंबर 19 ओवर हियर दिस इज आइडेंटिफाई द एरो मार्क स्ट्रक्चर ओवर हियर ना इफ व्हेन यू सी दिस इमेज तो सबसे पहले ना कंफ्यूजन क्या होती है फर्स्ट कंफ्यूजन व्हिच अकर्स इज कि वी व्हाट इज दिस ट्रांसफर सेक्शन दिस इज द ट्रांसफर सेक्शन ऑफ थोरैक्स एरिया और ऑफ द एब्डोमिनल एरिया ना दिस इज द ट्रांसफर सेक्शन ऑफ एब्डोमिनल एरिया आई हैव लाइक ट्राइड टू ट्रिक यू दैट आई हैव रिटन लंग आल्सो जस्ट टू ट्रिक but now when you see this image, first of all, I will come to this simplified image. And then again, we will come to the cross section. Again, we will come to the CT scan. When you see this image, this is the image of actually the transverse section of abdomen. Yes, very correct. I can see a lot of students, you are answering. Yes, 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 very correct. My future doctors, it is yes, spleen. So when you see the transverse section, so when you see this transverse section, this is a simplified image. When you see the vertebra behind, 
you know that this is what this is the posterior side of image and this is the anterior side of image and now when you are seeing this bigger triangular section so this bigger triangular section is what it is the liver it is the liver over here and after that this oval shaped structure is stomach and a small triangular section is spleen these are the three structures which are present in the line the liver is towards the right side and the spleen is towards the left side towards the posterior aspect of the image on the either side of vertebra there are two oval shaped structures which are kidney the right kidney and the left kidney another thing is vessels over here you should be able to identify inferior vena cava and the aorta aorta over here is descending aorta so as you see in front of the vertebra you can see a round section this is aorta descending aorta and when you see towards the towards the right side or towards the liver side a, a venous structure is seen which is inferior vena cava so this is a very very important uh, transverse section over here and another thing when you see over here is that <clears throat> there is a fold which is going from liver to the stomach this fold is known as lesser omentum there is a fold which goes from stomach to the spleen this fold is gastro splenic ligament and when you see the third fold over here this is the third fold which is going from the spleen to the kidney this fold is spleno renal ligament we have like over here i've just mentioned all the landmarks which are important over here even the ligaments the lesser omentum gastro splenic and the spleno renal all the structures so now when you come to this image over here you can very well see that this is what this is the vertebra over here then this is liver a small section of the stomach is seen over here and when you see this area this is what it is the spleen okay this is the spleen over here and towards the posterior side this oval shaped structures over here these are the kidneys and accordingly you say the right kidney over there and the left kidney then in front of the vertebra what do you see whatever round section is there this is the aorta this is the section of the aorta and then towards slightly right side whatever section you see is the section of the inferior vena cava so these are the main structures over here these are the main structures over here ascending aorta is in the thorax region okay it is in the thorax region aorta when it ascends makes a u turn arch of aorta and then it descends down so ascending aorta can only be seen in the thorax region not in the abdominal area so over here now we have understood that the arrow mark structure is what spleen <clears throat> so in this image now we know the arrow mark structure is spleen now another question over here let us try to answer this question which muscle is attached to the arrow marked area <clears throat> so now when you see this arrow marked area over here okay let us see this image this is a image of the bony pelvis and along with that femur is there and when you see this image the arrow is where arrow is on yes the arrow is on very correct ramdarain the arrow is on the muscle attached over here is swas major madhumita ansal mahipal nitesh very correct shubham very correct now what is this the arrow is actually on where the arrow is towards lesser trochanter it is a lesser trochanter of the femur and whenever we are talking about the lesser trochanter of femur there are two muscles attached to it it is the swas major and iliacus together they are also known as ilio swas so either of the name can be mentioned iliacus swas major ilio swas anything can be mentioned one more thing is that both the muscles they have a common action they help in the flexion where at hip joint so they can also ask you the question that uh, they can ask you that the arrow marked area the muscles which are attached to the arrow marked area what is the action of the muscles so the both the muscle they have a common action flexion at hip joint it is a flexion at the hip joint and opposite to this we say the another landmark which is over here <clears throat> what is this this is a greater trochanter this is a greater trochanter which gives attachment to gluteus medius and gluteus minimus 
ओके सो दिस अनदर लैंडमार्क विच इज ओवर हेयर आई विल जस्ट जूम इट फॉर यू दिस लैंडमार्क ओवर हेयर इज द ग्रेटर ट्रोकेंटर विच इज गिविंग अटैचमेंट टू टू मसल्स मीडियस एंड मिनिमस एंड बोथ द मसल्स दे हैव अ कॉमन एक्शन विच इज एपडक्शन एट हिप जॉइंट दिस इज एपडक्शन एट द हिप जॉइंट सो ओवे हेयर एनी ऑफ दम If they are asked, you have to answer it accordingly. They can ask you again that at greater trochanter, they can put the arrow. They can say the muscles attached over here. What action is done by that? The action is abduction. Both are helping in the abduction. So both the landmarks are very very important for you. The muscle attachment and the action done by this. So therefore, the answer over here for this landmark is swas major. So very correct. I can see everybody of you is answering. So very very correct. Now let us come to the image. Which is the most you can say, uh, which is the most favorite image for the examiner, and this is the image which the examiner always gives, and this image has not come in the July exam, so that makes it more clear to us that very high chances that the examiner can give this image, because this image examiner की favorite image है और एक बार नहीं आई है तो इसका मतलब पक्का से आ सकती है, and this is the image which any of you will not do wrong it should be a scoring marks for you it should be a bonus marks for you this image can never go wrong for you okay so make it make it a point that you don't go wrong in this image and if you see this image yes yes very very correct very correct so i can see everybody is answering over here so everybody is answering b so should i say answer is b yes the answer is b if you see the arrow the arrow is between the nucleus one nucleus over here another nucleus is at this location third nucleus at this location and the arrow is crossing the nucleus so therefore the arrow is where the arrow is towards the internal capsule it is towards the internal capsule so when you see this image over here these are the three nucleus over here the triangular nucleus from the lateral side is lentiform nucleus and towards the midline we say anterior side caudate nucleus posterior side thalamus and in between whatever area is there this v shaped area is what it is the internal capsule this is the internal capsule now over here we say that any triangular area this triangular area which is present over here the triangular blackish area which is present over here what is this it is the location of the lateral ventricle and between the two thalamus the triangular area over here is the location for the third ventricle as well as when you see in this image on the posterior side what is there is on the most posterior aspect you see some triangular area which is what superior sagittal venous sinus as you go in front of it a small roundish area is there which i have highlighted is the straight sinus so all these are very very important landmarks and uh, in the schematic image you can see again the same thing all the nucleus have been mentioned caudate lentiform thalamus these three nucleus in between them v shaped area internal capsule near the caudate the triangular area is lateral ventricle between the thalamus in the midline the ventricle is third ventricle and along with that from the lateral side if you see any depression that is a lateral sulcus and part of cerebrum which is surrounding the lateral sulcus is known as insula so all these landmarks are important for you you should be able to mark all the landmarks and when you see this image again the same thing what is the extra thing to see over here is that putamen globus pallidus the lentiform nucleus when you talk about the lentiform nucleus it is formed by putamen and the globus pallidus what is the location of globus pallidus the globus pallidus is towards the inner side towards the medial side and towards the outer side we have putamen so this point you should be knowing the examiner can focus on this putamen outside globus pallidus inside then apart from this when we are seeing the lentiform nucleus towards the outer side of lentiform nucleus you see some irregular structure which is what it is the claustrum it is the claustrum and now when you talk about the area which is between the claustrum and the lentiform nucleus what is it it is the location of external capsule so this is actually written as external capsule so these are the other options which you should be knowing that external capsule is where claustrum is where and now you have understood putamen and globus pallidus is also there the putamen is lentiform nucleus is formed by putamen and globus pallidus see these two are the components of lentiform nucleus 
okay so rahul you are asking putamen so putamen is a part of component of lentiform nucleus and when you see the image the putamen is a portion on the outer side of the lentiform if this complete is lentiform nucleus so in the lentiform nucleus the outer side is putamen and towards the inner side is globus pallidus so this is the same thing which is present over here external capsule is area between the claustrum and the lentiform nucleus so it is area which is between this claustrum irregular structure and lentiform nucleus so i have shown the external capsule in orange colored area so these are the other options which i mentioned over here and now we know the answer over here is internal capsule let us come to the next question now when you see the next question the question says and uh, endoscope is being passed by the clinician and he feels resistance when the endoscope has reached 23 cm from where incisor teeth now when you see this point 23 cm from incisor teeth you have understood that we are actually talking about esophageal constrictions the question can come as a direct question the question can come same thing can be asked as a clinical question so you should be prepared for every type of question direct question for esophageal constriction or clinical question now if they are saying 23 cm from incisor teeth so when you are putting the endoscope whenever you are talking about the esophageal constrictions you always measure the distance from incisor teeth and why because this is related to the clinical significance that when you are putting the endoscope you know that at what landmark you are reaching so whenever you are putting the endoscope so for example you are putting the endoscope over here and when you are putting the endoscope you <clears throat> reach to the first constriction so this is the first constriction and which is around at 15 cm from incisor teeth then as the more endoscope goes on the inner side it reaches a second constriction then the third constriction and finally to the fourth constriction and when you are talking about the constrictions over here this is the uh, chart which is showing all the constrictions the standard constrictions over here what are the standard constrictions these are the standard constriction first at beginning pharyngoesophageal junction also known as cricoesophageal junction second when it is crossed by arch of aorta third when it is crossed by left bronchus fourth when it is passing through diaphragm and what is the distance from incisor teeth the distance from incisor teeth usually they ask you in centimeter and what is it 15 this is 23 okay this is written as 23 15 23 28 40 so the standard at present in the latest edition of the grays and not me is this one this is which has been mentioned in the latest edition of grays anatomy 15 23 28 40 so these are the distances in centimeter from the incisor teeth and these are the four constrictions they can ask you a direct question that which constriction is present where second is at what location how many centimeter or they can ask you the same question in this way in the clinical pattern that endoscope has passed and the answer of this question as i can see yes very correct that it is arch of aorta it is arch of aorta see whenever we are talking about the esophageal constrictions uh, we say that these are the anatomical feature which are present in the esophagus so we follow this uh, table which is given in the grays anatomy latest edition so this is the standard table which you are going to follow if any question comes for esophageal constriction okay so now when you let us see the third another question question number 23 so we have reached the question number 23 and we will try to quickly finish it because already we have a lot of time uh, we have already gone for 2 hours so a person was climbing the staircase there was no light suddenly fell iron hit where on the neck after the injury the patient is unable to elevate unable to elevate the shoulder or you can say unable to shrug the shoulder as well as he is having difficulty in turning his head now this is a question which is uh, again on a nerve injury it is a upcoming question at present it has already been asked but it can be asked any time because it is one of the uh, upcoming question at present what is it if you see the question over here very very correct no 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 i can see a lot of 
A also, B also, C also, yeah. So now when you are talking about this quotient, when you see this image, you can see the arrow is put like this. Arrow is put like this, the shoulder is slightly going down. If you see in this image, the shoulder is slightly going down. They are not showing winging of scapula. The winging of scapula is always shown in this way, but nothing is shown like this. What they are showing, they are putting the arrow over here, the shoulder has dropped down. This is dropped shoulder. And whenever you are talking about the drop shoulder, what is it? The drop shoulder, when we are talking about it, <clears throat> for the drop shoulder, we say it is due to the spinal accessory nerve involvement. <clears throat> it is a spinal accessory nerve involvement. The spinal accessory nerve, it supplies trapezius as well as it supplies sternocleidomastoid muscle. Due to the trapezius involvement, there is a drop shoulder. And along with the drop shoulder, he is unable to shrug. So loss of shrugging also. This is loss of shrugging. What do you mean by shrugging? The loss of shrugging is this. This is a shrugging movement when you elevate the shoulder. So this movement is lost and we say loss of shrugging movement at the shoulder or he is unable to elevate the shoulder. Drop shoulder is on the affected side. The shoulder is slightly dropped down. So this is due to the trapezius involvement. And when we say sternocleidomastoid, when this is affected, it actually leads to a symptom that the patient has difficulty in turning the head. The sternocleidomastoid is a muscle over here. So when this is paralyzed, the patient is having difficulty in turning the head on the affected side. So the spinal accessory nerve supplies two muscles and due to the paralysis of two muscles, the all symptoms occur. So when you see the first symptom, the loss, unable to elevate the shoulder or shrugging, we say it is due to what? It is due to the involvement of trapezius. Second symptom, due to the involvement of sternocleidomastoid. When you see the injury, injury is in the neck. So the spinal accessory nerve is present in the posterior triangle of neck. And when the injury occurs over here, it quickly affects the spinal accessory nerve, leading to all these symptoms. The answer is not long thoracic nerve because there is no winging of scapula. The answer is not sternocleidomastoid because not only sternocleidomastoid, trapezius is also affected. So the best answer over here will be what? Spinal accessory nerve. Yes. Bilkul correct. Drop shoulder. Pushpa. So the answer over here is spinal accessory nerve. Now if you see the next question, this is the question on the arterial uh, <clears throat> supply the artery, arteries of the head and neck and when you are talking about the arteries in the arteries uh, the identification for arteries in the head and neck is very very important and when you see this first of all we will try to identify the arteries and then we will come back to the quotient now when you see what is a what is a a is this artery and what is this this is the facial artery. The artery which is running obliquely in the face is the facial artery. Now when you see B, now in the identification of B, you should be identifying it carefully because you have to identify between common carotid, external carotid, internal carotid. And now what is this? This is actually common carotid artery. So if I focus over here common carotid, this portion is common carotid. It divides into this is external carotid and this one is internal carotid. So the division is occurring at this level. So when you see common carotid artery, it further divides into external and internal. So this B is common carotid artery. And when you talk about C, C is what? It is subclavian artery. You can see this artery is going on lateral side. It is going towards upper limb. So the artery which is going straight above in the head and neck, that is what? Carotid artery. If the artery is taking a turn like this, then it is subclavian artery. Okay, so whenever you are talking about the arteries over here on the upper side, we say any artery you see going above in the head and neck, carotid. Any artery going laterally, taking a turn and going laterally, that is going to the upper limb, that is a subclavian artery. And this is a subclavian artery which goes towards the upper limb to form the axillary artery. So now we know A is facial, B is common carotid, C is subclavian. So we will come back over here to the question now. So we know A is facial, B is common carotid, C is subclavian artery. So now what you have to see which is incorrect statement. 
<clears throat> okay, so we have to see over here that which is the incorrect statement over here. So let us see first of all A. A is facial artery, which is a branch of external carotid. This is correct. Facial artery is a branch of the external carotid. B. B is, no, no, this is, B is common carotid. So this option is wrong. B is actually common carotid artery. C. C continues at axillary artery. C is subclavian artery. And the subclavian artery continues into axillary artery. This option is correct. Then D. Superior labial artery arises from A. Yes. The facial artery gives off superior labial artery which supplies the upper lip. So superior labial artery is a branch from A. So this is also correct. And the statement which is wrong over here is this one. So the answer of this question is this one. Now whenever we are doing this question, don't be like uh, worried about that what is written over here. These points you know. What is main for you is that in the image you should be able to identify the structure. If you are able to correctly identify the structure, you can answer it correctly. So, here are the points that are written in fact easy points. What is the main identification? That you correctly identify in the image. Mein, that what are the structures in the image. So, the answer over here. So, these are the branches over here. And when we say answer, the answer we know is B. And uh, <clears throat> now let us come to this next question. Yes, the clavian artery, it supplies the upper limb. Okay, right subclavian supplies right upper limb. Left subclavian supplies left upper limb. Okay. So both the upper limbs are supplied by each of the subclavian artery. And yes, external carotid artery we say is having the branches for which we say external carotid artery, it gives a branches. We remember by this mnemonic sulfopams in which we say SU is superior thyroid artery, L is lingual artery, F is facial artery, O is occipital, P is posterior auricular, a ascending pharyngeal, M maxillary and S is superficial temporal artery. When we are talking about external carotid, this is the external carotid. And further the external carotid gives this maxillary artery and superficial temporal artery, which are the terminal branches. And towards the anterior side of face, this artery is facial artery. The artery going to the thyroid gland is superior thyroid artery and the artery going to the oral cavity is lingual artery. So these are the other branches and finally towards the posterior side we say two posterior branches in which this is the occipital artery going to the occipital region and this is the posterior auricular artery. So these are the branches of external carotid. Right. And now the last question over here which I can see a, a, like a lot of you are answering also over here. Uh, Daisy, the superior thyroid we say is the first branch and ascending pharyngeal we say is the smallest branch. Okay. Then uh, the dermatome, let us see. Okay. The question number 25 is what is the dermatome of medial aspect of the leg? Okay. What is the dermatome of leg? So we are basically talking about the lower limb. Leg area is where? Below the knee. Below the knee area. And now in this specifically we are asking dermatome of medial aspect of leg. So I can see a lot of you have answered the question. Yes, yes. Very correct. Very correct. Nehla, Navya, Shri, Medico, Pratiti. Yes, very correct. Bohati badiya Shimam. Already saved a dermatome wallpaper. Pe. Yes, yes. Try to answer. Yes. The answer of this question is actually... If you see this image over here, this is the anterior aspect of the lower limb and they are saying dermatome of medial aspect of the leg. So if I focus on the medial aspect of leg, now you know what can be the answer. The answer over here is L4. Now when you are talking about the dermatomes over here, in the dermatomes how we remember over here the anterior side of the lower limb, the dermatomes are mainly lumbar. And towards the posterior side of lower limb, the dermatomes are sacral. The lumbar, lumbar dermatomes, the counting goes down. And the sacral dermatomes, the counting goes up. So when you see the dermatomes lumbar, L1, L2, L3. The L3 is at the level of knee. Okay? L3 is at the level of knee. And now below the knee, it is slightly different. L4 is towards the medial side. And the and the lateral side you are having L5. 
So one, two, three, simple counting and slightly different in the leg, medial side L4, lateral side L5. And when you say sacral, again the counting is there, but it is, counting is going up. S1 over here and uh, this complete area, this complete area is S2 and in the gluteal region you are having, in the gluteal region you are having S3, S4, S5. So the numbering is for the sacral also is going up. S1 towards the lower side, S2 in the leg and the thigh area and the rest of the dermatomes in the gluteal region. So this is for the lower limb. In the lower limb you have anterior side lumbar, posterior side sacral. When you are talking about upper limb, the dermatome is from C5 to T1 and the dermatome is going from outer to the inner side. Okay, so the dermatome is from outer to inner side. C5, C6, C7, C8, T1. So C5 to T1 in this way. C5, C6, C6 to the thumb, middle three fingers, C7, C8, little finger and on this inner side, then C8 is over here and then T1 over here. And when you see the chest region over here, in the chest region, all the dermatomes are in the form of horizontal strips in which very important is this dermatome which is at the level of umbilicus. And when you talk about the umbilicus, the dermatome is T10. So these are the important dermatomes over here, C5 to T1 upper limb, thoracic segments, thoracic dermatomes in the whole trunk area and the lumbar and the sacral dermatomes in the lower limb. So the answer over here is L4. The answer over here is L4, right? So these all are what? These are all spinal nerves. You are saying, Sukhbi, so ma'am, can you name dermatome nerves? The nerves over here are whatever we have written L3, L4. These are all spinal nerves. Yes, sub spinal nerves. Hoti hai. ठीक है जो स्पाइनल नर्व्स डायरेक्टली स्पाइनल कॉर्ड से आ रही है उन नर्व्स की बात हम कर रहे हैं तो डर्मोटोम का मतलब कि डायरेक्टली जो स्पाइनल नर्व स्पाइनल कॉर्ड से आ रही है उसकी बात हम कर रहे हैं राइट सो दिस इज ऑल 25 क्वेश्चंस एंड बिफोर वी एंड आई विल जस्ट क्विकली गो थ्रू दीज वेरी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट पॉइंट्स टीरियन व्हिच इज अ वेरी वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट क्वेश्चन फॉर यू एंड a very very highly repeated question, favorite question for the examiner. Location of the terion you should be able to tell and what structure is lying deep to it, it is middle meningeal artery. Then as you talk about this joint over here, pubic symphysis, this is secondary cartilaginous joint. And when you are talking about this image, x-ray, the superior view, this is a superior view of the foot in this, on the medial side of the foot, the bone which is present over here, this boat shaped bone is navicular and on the lateral side of the foot, this cube like bone which is present is cuboid. So you should be able to identify navicular and cuboid and when you say cleft lip, it is what? It is a non-fusion of medial nasal process and the maxillary process and apart from this, we also have this uh, <clears throat> two important uh, congenital anomalies. Whenever we say uracal fistula, the keyword over here is urine dribbles from umbilicus. It is due to the defect in the LN twice, completely patent in LN twice. When you say bitline fistula, in this the symptom changes fecal material or the meconium comes from umbilicus. The defect is in the vitlo intestinal duct. So these two important fistulas and now very important, the clinical structure, the clinical procedure lumbar puncture in which very very important what are the three ligaments pierced from outer to inner side supraspinous ligament interspinous ligament and ligamentum flavor okay these are the three ligaments which are pierced from outer to inner side so these are the other points which i have covered over here so totally we have discussed 25 questions as well as we have discussed uh, some other important points and i hope this two hour session is very very helpful for you it is just like a quick revision covering all the important points which can come in your exam so good luck to all of you have faith in yourself and work hard always be optimistic and never give up so never give up you will surely reach your destination Okay, you will surely reach your destination. So, is the pehle ki session finish ho, do line or, do line or meri taraf se, ye ek, kuch aisi lines se, jo sabke man mein chalti hai, sabke dimag mein ye lines rehti hai, ki zara mujhe kamyaab to hone do mere dost, zara mujhe kamyaab to hone do mere dost, mera din bhi a jayega. Zara mujhe kamyaab to hone do mere dost, mere din bhi a jayenge. Wo char log, वो चार लोग जो मेरे पीछे बातें बनाते हैं वो चार लोग जो मेरे पीछे बातें बनाते हैं वो लोग भी मेरे पीछे चल कर आएंगे सो अ डे विल कम व्हेन ऑल द पीपल हु आर अराउंड यू 
विल बी कमिंग आफ्टर यू सो देर विल बी अ डे वो दिन आएगा ज़रूर और ये एक ऐसी सिचुएशन है जो सब फेस करते हैं इस समय सब फेस कर रहे होंगे कोई कुछ बातें बना रहा है कोई कोई बातें बना रहा है लेकिन जिस दिन तुम प्रूव कर दोगे उस दिन वही लोग हैं जो तुम्हारे पीछे पीछे चल के आएंगे सो बेस्ट ऑफ लक टू ऑल ऑफ यू बेस्ट विशेज टू ऑल ऑफ यू एंड नाउ आई विल जस्ट फिनिश द सेशन सो बेस्ट ऑफ लक टू ऑल ऑफ यू इफ एनी डाउट्स यू कैन ऑलवेज मैसेज मी एंड यू कैन ऑलवेज आज द डाउट्स सो बाई टू ऑल ऑफ यू एंड बेस्ट ऑफ लक